There we go. Well, well Grant, I'm not, I'm not sure you remember me. Uh, we were, uh, we went to camp together. Your, your dad was a obviously Calvin Hill uh, football great. He was a, he was a pro at the NFL uh, Players Association camp near Culpeper. And you were, uh, you were six years old. You were uh, just following dad and the camp was for eight to 12. Or, so you're definitely uh, below the age. Uh, but we were on the same team, uh, me, you, and uh, Sherman Douglas. And uh, I, I don't know if Sherman ever mentioned this to you, but we, we won the championship that week. And I, I actually played against Sherman in high school. So we, we weren't really in touch, but at least, you know, we recognized each other. Did, did Sherman ever mention that to you uh, later on in life, that he knew you? No, no, I, I did not know that story. I mean, I, I remember, I think it was called uh, Camp Rapidan or, or yeah. uh, Camp Rapidan. And I know I was a little kid tagging along with my dad. Yeah. And somehow they, I got put on certain teams and, and, you know, I was the young kid out there. But uh, so I remember the camp. I remember there were like these, uh, you kind of slept, it was overnight camp. And I remember yeah. the the facilities, um, yeah. but I didn't remember Sherman Douglas, and uh, yeah. I, I, that's that's funny. I didn't know that, and I've seen obviously, you know, uh, having played against Sherman many years, but ne yeah. never heard that story before. So that's pretty funny. Well, I'm surprised he didn't recognize you because we all knew that you were Calvin's son. So I'm, I'm you you probably wouldn't have recognized him because he was he was four years older than you. But I'm surprised right. he never mentioned it because we all we all knew who you were, and you you did really well. I mean, you were much younger than us, but you were as tall. You're probably only a couple inches shorter than me at the time. And uh, we, we won the championship and Sherman every moment was off playing basketball. He just, he was not happy there that week. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Um, That's funny. Yeah. Well, look, first of all, congratulations on the new job. Uh, I mean, you've had a busy few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you on that. And uh, it, it has been uh, a little bit of a busy time, but uh, you know, with, with the, the three, four weeks of March madness and then, uh, you know, the announcement of USA basketball that that had been in the works for, you know, almost a year. And uh, mm -hmm. it just so happened, though, uh, the announcement came right during the final four. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, no, it's great. It's fun to, uh, to have many different roles and responsibilities, you know, in and around the game of basketball. And uh, yeah. I'm fortunate now after my, you know, after my my, my playing days are, are over to still you know, still be around it, work in it, uh, and, and have fun uh, with, with the game. And so uh, I, I feel like I'm, I'm lucky and honored and privileged to, to be able to do what I do. Well, it's, it says a lot about you that you uh, made, made time for me, made time for us with all this, all this going on. But that's typical of you because uh, everyone who's from Northern Virginia has a Grand Hill story. Everyone knows you. Like, oh, yeah, we used to play racquetball together or soccer together. So I think you were, you were a celebrity at a young age. I mean, by the time you were a freshman in high school, everybody, at least everyone knew who you were. Uh, but you always seem like a really accessible guy, which, uh, you know, obviously says a lot about you. Well, I appreciate that. I, I've enjoyed uh, your, your podcast and uh, have, have watched a few. And, you know, just, you know, for me, it was a you know great time back in the 80s, um, even before I was in high school, just, you know, following high school basketball and um, mm -hmm. really was a part of, you know, your, you know, your social, your social uh, life you know i think it, you know you sometimes forget you know before technology um you know before social media you know before there were so many um you know so much competition for for people's entertainment dollars you know what you did back in the day was you went to the movies you went to eat or you went mm -hmm. you know, to high school sporting events and uh and so i vividly remember some of the uh and some i don't remember but i remember some of the stories and uh and certainly um, you know, hearing people's perspectives going way back when. I, I used to watch, you know, the 81, 82 South Lake Seahawks with Michael Jackson and mm -hmm. you know, that whole crew. Um, uh, I think Vince Howard, Steve B.C., Robert Allen. You know, so that was sort of my first introduction to basketball and, and mm -hmm. I, you know, wanting to play basketball and following, you know, those teams and, and, and onward. And so, and then, you know, venturing out outside of Reston and seeing other schools as well. So, uh, fond memories, uh, and certainly fun to hear different people's, you know, stories and, and, and perspectives behind the scenes accounts. It's, it's really cool. So, so when did you guys, when, when did you guys come to, uh, to Reston? I know your dad came to the Redskins in 77 or so. So I assume that's when you guys moved into the area and people, you know, we, we talk about the stars of the game, star coaches, star players, 
And so people have claimed you, uh, just like uh, Tommy Amaker. They said, oh, he was in Little River, he was here. Um, so when, when did you guys actually get to rest? And, and before, uh, for folks who don't know Reston, Reston was a planned community. It was a very special place because uh, uh, Fairfax County uh, was still slow to segregate. Uh, there was mostly, most of the Western part of the county, there wasn't very many minorities. So Reston came in in the seventies and they had, it was a planned community with different socioeconomic levels, lots of minorities. And it really created this environment for success for sports and, and everything. It was, a, it was a very exciting time. So when, when did you end up going to Reston? Yeah, no, I mean, I think you're spot on. We, we moved to Reston. So my dad, you know, he left the Cowboys, went to Hawaii to play in the World Football oh, League. That's right, yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the league kind of folded because, you know, they overpaid for, you know, for players like my dad. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, he ended up signing with the Redskins. George Allen was the coach uh, at the time. And the Redskins um, practice facility was kind of out by Dallas Airport. And, mm. uh, and so Reston was sort of, as you said, this new community, so it was a planned community, uh, really an interesting experiment, uh, mixing, you know, all sort of ethnicities, socioeconomic, uh, you know, classes, uh, and, and sort of like having a, a melting pot, if you will, at a time, you know, in the, in the late 70s, I, I think it was 76, I was four years old when we moved uh, to Reston. And, you know, we moved into our house and in South Lakes High School and, and, and the, media, the middle school, Langston Hughes and Terrace at my element, they were all planned to be built, but they weren't built yet. And I think my dad picked, he picked the house in the neighborhood we, 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 uh, we moved into uh, because I would never have to cross the street to go to school. And so all three of those schools were behind my house. Uh, and so, but, um, you know, a lot of the Redskin players were, were, were kind of in that area at the time, and Joe Theismann and, you know, Dave Butts and um, uh, Charlie Taylor and, you know, guys like that from, from way back when, uh, they all lived in Reston because it was a unique sort of, uh, a, a unique community at the time. And, uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, um, those were, you know, that was a long time ago, but those were certainly fun, fun times. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a, a really unique environment to, to grow up in, very diverse, you know, kind of progressive considering the times and, mm. uh, you know, certainly fond memories of, of those early years. When I, when I used to coach AAU many, many years later, I loved getting South Lakes kids because they were, they, they had no problem with race. Uh, the white kids and black kids always got along on the team and they had no problem with money. You know, the, the rich kids, if there's, you could take them anywhere. They, they weren't afraid. They weren't afraid to play inner city environment. So you can go down to these places like Richmond and Danville. These boys would battle. I, it was my favorite demographic to coach South Lake. They're always well behaved. They, they didn't trip when we were on the road. So it, it, was, a, it was a really uh, special place. So when, you, when your dad got traded or when he signed with the Cleveland Browns, did you go? Did you guys have to go to Cleveland for a while or did, did you guys stay behind in Reston at that, t at that point? So we stayed. My mom at the time, um, she was working at the Pentagon and uh, in the late 70s. And then she eventually started her own, you know, consulting firm on, in 1980 on Capitol Hill. So, you know, she was was building her, um, you know, her business and her career. And, uh, and and my dad was at the tail end of his football career. So mm -hmm. I, I think the plan was always to stay uh, in D.C. Uh, and in Northern Virginia. Uh, and we did, you know, and so we, we would go up, you know, on, on weekends for home games. And, uh, you know, I, for me, I was so young when my dad, you know, played in Cleveland and, and, and obviously even in Washington. But, you know, I was, I think I was 10. Yeah, I was probably about nine or 10 when he retired. So I, my, my memories are in Cleveland. Ryan Seip, Ozzie Newsome, Mike Pruitt, you know, those guys, that crew, that era. Um, you know, being able to go in the locker room. You know, just being on the sidelines, like all, all those times, those were, were fond memories. Uh, and we used to go up on, on, on every year for Thanksgiving. And, and my dad's position coach at, at running back um, was Coach Garrett, who, whose son was Jason Garrett. And, uh, and Jason Garrett was, you know, a few years older than me. And so, you know, he had, a, you know, all his brothers, we played football in the backyard or whatever. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, being around it, you know, football was my first, my first, first love. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, just wasn't allowed to play it. <laughs> so yeah. uh, it quickly moved down to pecking order. Your dad didn't want you to play football? 
So he, he, he didn't play football until he was in high school. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, his first love was baseball. Um, but he, he just felt, you know, that, that you needed to, to be a little bit more developed. And he didn't want, you know, some third grade football coach thinking they were Vince Lombardi, you know, out there teaching kids the wrong. So the, the plan, I think, was, was always for me to wait, you know, until I got to high school. But, you know, by then I, you know, I had fallen in love with basketball. And I was, you know, I was probably about six, three, you know, 160 pounds as a freshman. So I, I wasn't built for football. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I met your dad uh, late, later on. He, he used to go up to the Tyson's Club and work out. And me and uh, Gerald Purnell, Gerald is Oliver Purnell's younger brother. Uh, uh, he used to always talk to us. He said, yeah, I, I like talking to lawyers, but I, but I don't have to pay for it. Uh, he was always, you know, very... <laughs> He's always say that, and, and I was I was a fan of your father. I, I never told him this, but uh, I was a big Doonesbury uh, fan of, of the comic strip in the seventies when I was a company of age, and uh, you know it took place at Yale. And the, one of the characters there is BD, which is Brian Dowling, and he was into your father's Yang at Yale. So I, I did watch those games live. I was too young, but I had studied them. And, and when he started playing for the Cowboys, I liked him. I liked him and Bob Hayes a lot. Those my, when I first started understanding football. Those were my running backs. They were both really fast. Uh, I mean, your dad, his game changed over time, but he was a fast runner when he was a young, a young player. So I guess we all were young once. Uh, so, yeah. um, that, that is true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, he was hanging in there. So, so anyway, so when, when did you start playing, you get in the basketball now, when did you start playing travel basketball? So and who did you play for? Did you play for the wrestling team out there? Yeah. So, you know, so my first love, the first, the first sport I played was soccer. And, uh, you know, I was, was, you know, really into soccer, played travel soccer, uh, was fortunate to, to go and, you know, we'd go to tournaments in, you know, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Canada. So we, we were on a good, we were a good team. It wasn't because of me, but uh, we, we had a good team. And, and so, uh, and I also played basketball, you know, Reston had, uh, I think, a great youth basketball program. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and so a lot of us who who've come through the ranks obviously started off in that in that uh, in that sort of you know lower level, and then they had the travel team. I remember I tried out I tried out for the travel team. They had a you had like a, a seventh grade team and an eighth grade team, or or I guess it was a, a, a twelve year old team and a thirteen year old team. And mm -hmm. so I tried out when I was nine for the twelve year old team. And you talk about playing up, like I. I would play with my own kid, my own you know age group, but also a lot of times would play up. And I got cut when I was nine. I got cut when I was ten. But then when I was eleven, I made the twelve and under team. And um, mm -hmm. and so that was sort of my first introduction to kind of like now we're playing other you know other towns in the in the DMV area. Um, and and then the following year, um, is that right? Yeah, the following year I played. 13 and under, and I was 12. And we went on and won the state championship. So we won on the, the local region area, if you will. Uh, we played up at, I think it was up at Robinson or Lake Braddock, one of the big gyms mm -hmm. uh, there. And uh, and then we went down to uh, Norfolk and played at the Scope and, and ended up winning the state championship. And wow. uh, a couple of guys that ended up playing with me in, uh, at high school, uh, Mike Ellison, Mike Taylor, they were on the team. I know both Mike. Uh, yeah, you know the mics, and then Scoot Vertino, who went to um, went to, to Flint Hill, and is coincidentally my boss at NBA TV. Um, oh, wow. he, he he was on that team. Bobby Graves. So I was the young one. I was the only seventh grader. They were all in eighth grade, and uh, and we won that. And then I played my my eighth grade year. I played. I'm not even sure why, but I played for Great Falls, and mm -hmm. uh, and. We ended up losing, I think, in the region. We lost to maybe was it Braddock Road or mm. Braddock Road? Yeah. Yeah, B -R -B -R -Y -C, Braddock Road. Yeah. yeah. So we didn't go down to the states that year, um, mm. but I had a teammate on that team, uh, Mark Meyer, who Mark Myers, who played at O'Connell. Uh, he was. Mark? Yeah. So Mark's, Mark's, well, Mark was on that team, and his dad had, you know, that Bill was, Meyer. Bill Meyer. Meyer. Yeah. Bill yeah. Meyer, yeah, Bill Meyer. So, you know, Bill, Bill um, had played, I think he played professionally for a little bit. Um, I never quite knew where, but uh, I know he played and he was really into basketball. And, and so he introduced me to AAU. 
And I had never heard of AAU before prior to that. And, um, and so, you know, I kind of got invited to play on Mark's team. And, uh, and so that was sort of through Great Falls, I got introduced to AAU basketball. Mm -hmm. And all that kind of happened before I got to high school. Yeah, but by the time I played against Bill, he was an enforcer. He was up at the health club that I was talking about where, where I met your dad. I mean, Bill, Bill would take you out. It was uh, like the Beef Brothers of Rick Mahorn and Rulin. He, he, he was like those guys. No, he was. I mean, I, I never played with Bill, but I, I could see that. I could see that for sure. But yeah. what's crazy, I just want to say this. Um, so I ended, up, I ended up joining the team. Uh, Jamie Warren was on that team. And his dad, yeah, Jamie Warren who was the head basketball coach at West Springfield High School. So we were all 13, it was the summer of 86. And they had a local Potomac Valley sort of region. You had to win the Potomac Valley. So this was all, this was all kind of new to me. Yeah. And so we go down to PG County, we played a bunch of teams down there. Uh, we win, you know, easily. And, and then we go to nationals. And we go to nationals in uh, St. Louis. And first team we play, uh, the Detroit Super Friends with Chris Weber, you know, Jalen wow. Rose, Ron Leonard, um, you know, and, and, you know, we played them and they had the nice sweatsuits. They had the, you know, the, the box radio on the baseline during warmups. And we came out there and we blitzed them. We beat them by like third. Is that, and, is that right? And then we went on to win the national wow. championship. We won the national champ. We beat uh, Indianapolis. Uh, municipal gardens and so with alan henderson uh he was on that team um and so that was you know that was a huge lift a huge confidence booster if you will prior to you know entering high school and uh, now the interesting thing was all those guys were a year behind me in school so i started high school at 13 i was young and mm -hmm. uh started college at 17. um so sometimes i wish my parents had held me back you know and i might even you know but um but that was that was huge. That that experience, you know, going through that, having that kind of exposure, and kind of measuring yourself against other top players who you who were you know my age, I think really kind of gave me a big lift before I you know entered high school. Yeah, nowadays your dad would have waited. I guess I think you're like six days past the cutoff or something like October's. They would they would have waited and put you in the right grade, and then they would have held you back. They would have reclassed you because that's what kids <laughs> do now, you know. But, you, you always played against guys older than you. I remember, I remember when you got to Duke, you were, you were, you were a real young guy. So, um, and I, I was going to say, Jamie Warren, uh, he, he went to Robinson for a while. He was a big guy at a very young age. I mean, he was, he was, he was just buckets at a very, a very young age. Uh, Jamie, I, Jamie was like shaving in, 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 in seventh grade. Like, I mean, he, he had a full beard, you know, and, uh, it, yeah. and it's funny because Jamie was like six, he was MVP that year in 86 yeah. and we won we beat Indiana on a last second play. Jamie had a layup um, and we won the game. Mm. And, and Jamie was a man. And, 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 and look, Mo Mashburn, Chris Weber, Alan Henderson. I mean, the list of, of, of all these guys who went on and, and played professionally, and I'm probably leaving out some. You know, Jamie was the biggest guy and, and the most physical guy there. Now, I don't know if yeah. he grew much since then. Yeah. Uh, but at that time, he was a <laughs> man out there and, uh, and really good and really dominant. And, and his dad was an incredible coach. I mean, yeah. Jeff Warren was, I mean, we were, the, we were the best coach. I mean, we were running the flex. We had all different types of sets and offenses. And, and, uh, and so my first introduction to great, to, to truly great coaching uh, was Jim Warren. Yeah, Jim, he, he was a very underrated coach, great, great coach. And, you know, Jamie was one of the hardest working kids because he knew he had to work on his speed. He knew kids were going to catch up to him. He'd be at Robinson with those sponge shoes that they used to have back in the, in the 80s like, to work on your jumping ability. He worked for hours by himself. And we did a podcast of the, ni of the 90, uh, 92, 91 Final Four. Quinn Harwood was on for, for South Lakes. And you can tell Jamie is still, it still hurts him that he never lived up to that promise when he was MVP. Uh, you know, he's still... He talks about his his basketball career with a lot of pain, and he made him really real. I mean, he's he's such an awesome guy, uh, but he he never got over that, that he was that he lost mm. him so early. But you know that's that's the way it is, right? Mm. That's yeah, tough. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So 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 anyway, did you play uh, from a very young age? Did you play in the perimeter, um, or did you know back then they, they put you in in the middle because you're you're probably taller than most of the kids? Yeah, you know, 
I, I, um, I was always a fan of like big guys who could handle the basketball. And I remember back, so I remember when I first started playing, I was, you know, the seventh and seven and eight year old league in Reston. We used to play at Hunter's Woods Elementary School. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was on Saturdays. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, I was a big guy. I'd be inside, I'm rebounding, I'm posting up. And, you know, at that age, no guard can get you the ball. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, no one's going to get you the ball inside. And so, you know, our team would just lose, you know, we would you know, lose 23 to two. And, 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 uh, and so I remember the next year, my dad said, when you get the rebound, just bring it up. Like, don't, don't outlet it to the guard. Just get a defensive rebound and bring it up the court and try to get a layup. And I pretty much did that the rest of my career. And, <laughs> and so, uh, although I was big, I think early on, eight, nine years old, you know, I was able to get a rebound and then bring the ball up the court. And then the more you did it, the more confidence you got. And, um, and then, you know, you, you play pickup ball. I mean, I play a lot of pickup ball. You know, nowadays, <clears throat> you know, you, there's not a lot of pickup ball, not a lot of going to the park. No. It's strictly mm -hmm. AAU and it's, it's you know, it's, it's individual instruction. And I, I think the individual instruction is good, but the one criticism I have of it is it, it teaches you how to play in a silo. Mm -hmm. And you're always sort of working on you. You're working on your stuff. You're working on your moves. And you're not really lurk, learning how to play with other people. You're not mm -hmm. learning how to collaborate and figure things out. And, and so for me, you know, when I'm 9, 10 years old and I'm playing with 12, 13-year-olds or I'm playing, you know, twin branches, I'm, I'm 12 and I'm playing with adults, I can't play with them how I play with my own age group. So I have to figure out how I can add value. So maybe that's setting screens, maybe that's playing defense, uh, maybe it's just not getting in the way, you know? And as I always say, if it's game point and, and someone who's not really capable takes a shot or does something ill-advised, then they're not gonna get picked. And so the objective in pickup ball was to win and to stay on the court and run the court. And, and so I do think, you know, pickup ball, it just teaches you, you can, I can go anywhere in the world. I can't now, cause I can't, I can't run anymore, but I could go anywhere if I could run and I could go anywhere in the world, not be able to speak the language, not know anybody and, and, and jump into a game and be able to figure things out. Okay. Who is a dominant personality? You know, who's the shooter? Who's the hustle guy? You know, who's the guy, you know, who's the assist that you can figure it out and you figure out, okay, how can I play my position? How can I figure out, uh, you know, how can I add value? How can we together collectively win and stay on the court? And so I think some of that's missing in this day and age in grassroots basketball. Now, I love the individual work, you know, and I wish in some respects we did more of that. But my individual work was I played. I just hooped every day. We played pickup ball. And that was whether against my friends or against older kids. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think so, you know, I think as a result of that, you had sometimes to play on the perimeter. You know, I might have been tall for my age, but I had to be able to, you know, you know, navigate, handle the ball, play on the wing. So I think that really helped me develop my all around sort of versatility, if you will. Yeah. When you take the, when you take pickup out of basketball, you take a little bit of the edge out of the game. Uh, you know, when you, when you go to your courts, we used to go to side and stricker and sometimes we go to um, the one in Vienna, not away. And most of the high school teams, they, we bought, we bought our five and, you know, game point it's, it's intimidation. No, no one wants to leave that court. It, it's so much involved and pick up. And when you take that out of the game, it does take a little bit of the, uh, the edge off the, off the game. And the game comes a little bit nicer, I think. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a gamesmanship. Uh, you know, I, I love problem solving. You know, like, okay, mm -hmm. I call foul. You know, how are we going to resolve this? You know, mm -hmm. we can argue, we can do this, we can do that. We can, mm -hmm. you know, are you convincing? Are you able to, you know, are we going to shoot for it? Whatever the case may be, but there is. There's, there's, a, there's a, 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 a gamesmanship. There's a, you know, sort of the, the whole notion of, um, you know, intimidation, you know, mm -hmm. uh, reading people's body language um, mm -hmm. and, and just survival. You know, you're trying to you're trying to stay on the court, you know, you're mm -hmm. trying, to, you know. And so, you know, if, if somebody's coming at you and so I'll tell you a funny story. So because I was young and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would always sometimes like, you know, I'd get invited to play. You know, South Lakes used to used to have open gym in the summer. And so a lot of times when I was in middle school, I might've been in sixth, seventh grade, uh, eighth grade, you know, there, there were three courts at South Lake. And a lot of times I might be on the side court, you know, playing with kids my own age. 
and then you might, you know, you might get picked to go or somebody's they're missing somebody. So you, you go play on the, on the main court. And a lot of times it's really funny um, because I was young, they would always have me like matched up with Christy Winters and Christy Winters was, you know, she was about four or five years older than me. And, and um, you know, was a great, uh, I think she was like player of the year in Virginia, might've been player of the year in the country. Six, four. No, no joke. <laughs> God, now, who was one of my teammates. And so Christy yeah. gave me the business. Like she used to just kill me, you know? And, and, uh, and you know, obviously I was a fan of hers. Um, but, you know, you, you um, yeah, I mean, you know, pickup ball was huge. And, and I think it saddens me that you don't, you know, I, I, I didn't go to Nottaway. I, I was insulated right in rest. I used to go to Twin Branches. Right. Many times I would drive by there on, on the afternoon in the summer, you know, years later, um, even, you know, even as, as recently as five years ago. And I'm like, nobody's out there, you know, nobody's playing. No. And, um, it it kind of saddens me because, you know, that those were, you know, that's where I learned how to play. That's how I learned how mm -hmm. to develop a grit, a toughness, uh, a versatility, an understanding of how to play, how to collaborate with others. Um, and, and that served me well, you know, throughout throughout my career. Um, as, as as head of Team USA, are you going to try to encourage uh, a pickup culture again, or is that something you're going to take on, or maybe that ship has already sailed? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I look, I, I I don't officially start or don't officially begin until after this Olympics. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Jerry Colangelo is, is currently the, the active acting uh, managing director, but. You know, he's done a, 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 an incredible job of, you know, just sort of reestablishing you know, USA basketball, um, you know, a, as a dominant program, you know, internationally. And also, you know, I think uh, bringing in a lot of young players in high school, you know, and sort of into the pipeline, if you will, and the various international teams that are out there. Uh, but we have an opportunity. It's always good to sort of press the refresh button and, and take a look and, and get a real sense of, okay, where are we? Uh, try to anticipate sort of where things are going, how can we be best in class in all areas? So I, I never really thought about uh, taking that on, but that that's something that, mm. um, you know, look, sometimes it's just gotta be fun. You know, sometimes you, you know, you can, I always say you can do ball handling drills, you know, mm -hmm. and I think those are important, but do they translate onto the court? And, yeah. and to be, you know, learning how to do it with nine other people and, 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 and doing it in environments that are unpredictable, things you mm -hmm. can't necessarily script. Um, you know, that's, that's where I learned how to dribble the basketball was actually right. doing it in those type of settings. And so I'm not trying to minimize the, 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 the drill work. I think that's important. Right. There has to be a balance, I believe. It has yeah, to I, be think, I think it's, I'm sorry. I think it also has to be fun. You know, I think sometimes, yeah. you know, these games and, you know, AAU and, you know, this sort of this, we, we got to be successful at 10 years old. And if we want to be on this trajectory to play in college or make it to the NBA, and, and, and then, you know, the, the, the workouts, the individual workouts, which are incredibly impressive, but it takes the fun out. Of it. You know, I think yeah. sometimes yeah. just going to the park and playing and having fun and socializing, you know, we're missing that part of it, which I think is, is important uh, in the long run. Yeah, the, the Brazilians and the Africans, and you're, you're a soccer guy, they, they're the most creative players because they still spend time playing on the beach, playing on Sandlot. And so they, they do things, they, the Europeans and the Americans are training like you're talking about in basketball and do more of that training. It's all kind of organized, kind of sanitized. And so, you know, we actually, they do drills in soccer to make you creative, let, let the ball run or something. Whereas, you know, the third world countries, the creativity is just part of the, the DNA of the soccer, you know? You know, so, you're right. And it's funny, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead here, but one thing, you know, Coach K, um, you know, one thing that I, I, I I respect and admired with Coach K, or many things, but he used to tell me, like, he'd say, son, you can do things I can't teach. So do them, don't be a robot, you know? Yeah. And so he was trying to empower me to just, you know, one of my issues was, you know, trying to fit in and not trying to step on people's toes. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he was trying to push me to go out and be, you know, to be great, but, you know, have that freedom, you know, have that freedom to express yourself and play. and and. And you can't always script it, you know, you can't always, you know, you, you, you got to just play. And it's almost like a jazz ensemble where you have structure yeah. and within that you have the ability, um, you know, to, to, to improvise. And, and basketball is nothing but a game of, improv uh, you know, of, of, of improvising and, and showing your, you know, sort of a, a way of expressing yourself. And I know I'm yeah. getting a 
out there, but I, I really no, no, I, I agree with that. So, uh, so to go back to uh, middle school. So when it comes time to choosing a high school, um, obviously your reputation is is growing. I, I'd heard of you in the eighth grade, and I, and I was I was already at UVA. Um, did you seriously consider going to a private school? Now there wasn't as many options um, as as there are now, but Dennis Scott was was over at Flint Hill. I guess he was there by by then, um, and then there's there's the schools downtown. Um, what was your thought process? So you know, Dennis was at Flint Hill. Flint Hill was was really kind of you know in their heyday, and Dennis Dennis was the you know he might have been the best high school player I ever saw. And, and Dennis lived in Reston, so you know I'd see him play against him. I still remember Dennis was in high school. Billy King, who's from the area, was uh, at Duke, and I think was college basketball's defensive player of the year. And Dennis might have been a sophomore or junior in high school. And we're up at South Lakes. And I'm watching Dennis just give Billy the business. Like, you know, Dennis just was going at him like you wouldn't believe. And so, you know, Dennis could shoot the ball, but Dennis also had handles for a guy six seven. He could cross you, like he could cross you up and and he he was just complete and it, it became a you know a shooter, I guess later on in his career. But yeah. his overall overall all around game was incredible. Um, so, you know, Flint Hill was up and coming, I think nationally ranked, um, but there was none. There was never, I mean, DeMatha was always on the radar. You know, Gonzaga was a school that was in the city. Um, you know, obviously a bunch of private schools. You know, I think back then there was more balance. You know, you had great players in the inner high in DC, you had great players in PG County. Uh, you had great players in the Catholic League. Um, you had great players in the public school league in Virginia. Um, there was sort of, it was like spread around a little bit, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I think there's been a more of a, of a, of a push now to, to private school, which I don't fully understand why, but, um, but no, there was never, in, like my goal in life was to play at South Lakes. And that was yeah. a dream of mine. Um, and I would go watch the games from a little kid, you know, from eight years old. Uh, Michael Jackson, his crew, um, you know, Robert Allen, Gerald Price, um, you know, Willie Page. That's Ryan. my boy, Willie. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all those guys, like I grew, I watched those guys. And so that, that to me was like the one day there was a real pride that, you know, okay, I want to play here at South Lakes and, uh, and follow in those guys' footsteps. What, what did you know about Wendell Bird? So now, nowadays, Wendell Bird is a coach that has produced probably 25 Division One players. I'm, I'm not even sure. There's so many we probably forget them if we try if we tried to name them. But at the time, uh, Coach Lewis, you know, another real trailblazer, he'd been the coach in, at least when I was there. So I graduated in '84. So Bird was a relatively young coach when you, when you started. Yeah, I mean, so I remember Coach Bird was was on. I, you know, I remember Jim Lewis. He was the head coach, and he had mm -hmm. you know just a a great personality and a presence about him. And uh, even went, you know, to the basketball camps at South Lakes. And then I think Coach Lewis left, went to George Mason, I think the coach, the women's team. That's right, yeah. And uh, and then Bird took over. And um, and so, you know, I mean, I, I knew, you know, Coach's wife, I remember Jason when he was just a little kid and he was, you know, he was trying to think, he was, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years younger than me. Um, and uh, I remember, I think his wife was the kind of in, the head of the cheerleaders, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. and so um, kind of you know oversaw them and and, and what they were doing. Uh, I'd go to the camps, so I was just I was I was a South Lakes kid, and um, mm -hmm. I'll even say this: so I was so ingrained at South Lakes. My eighth grade year at Langston Hughes, which was right across the street from South Lakes, uh, all my buddies were 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 on the freshman team at South Lakes, and so I would go and. I was like their water boy. Like I'd sit behind the bench. I'd give them water when they came out of the games. Uh, and I'd go there and watch the, the freshman, the JV, and then, you know, and then the, the varsity game, um, you know, all that, you know, that same, that same evening. And then when, when, when the boys would go out of town, I, I would be there to watch the girls play. And so, you know, Christy Winters and Terry Bradley and, mm. and that crew who, who went on to win a state championship. So there was never, you know, there was never any doubt that I would go to South Lakes. That was never a question. Um, and, and I don't think I ever was really like recruited or pursued or anything like that. It was it was always kind of understood that that's where I was going to be. So your your freshman year, 
that that's the thing I didn't I didn't know as well. See, at, at the time I was a U, I was a UVA between eighty four and ninety one undergrad in law school, so I would only see the regional tournament. I come back for that and I and I see the state. So after ninety one, you know, I was officiating stuff, so I know most of what happened. But I would only see the tournaments, so I didn't get to see you in, in your freshman and sophomore year because I know you got upset um, in the regionals. Who was who was on your freshman team? It must have been Rob Robin, Rob Robinson's sophomore year. Um, so who was on your freshman team? So I mean, uh, your varsity team as a I'm sorry, your varsity team as a freshman. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So um, so John Lewis was a senior point guard. Jerome Scott mm -hmm. was a junior. Um, mm -hmm. Chris Mullen was a small forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, Chip Crawford, who uh, I yeah. think was a junior that year. Uh, and and that, that was the starting five. I was sort of the power forward. I, I didn't want to play varsity. I wanted to play freshman. And um, and so part of it was I knew my eighth grade, you know, in eighth, in eighth grade, like we had a, a bunch of really good ball players, and you know, my friends were on that freshman team, and and they had a great run, Rob and Mike and Mike Taylor and those guys, and so I think they were like eighteen and three, and so it was like, can we, can we be better than them? And when we right. come in, and so I ended up moving up to varsity, um, but that freshman team went undefeated, and. Uh, oh. It was probably a good thing because I probably would have messed it up, but um, <laughs> they didn't but, need you. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, my first year, I mean, I, you know, I was a little bit overwhelmed. I think um, I, mean, I still, you know, somehow put up nine, ten points a game, um, mm -hmm. you know. But but I wasn't the first or, or even the second option. You know, I think I just, you know, really just kind of rebounded, defended, you know, played off of people, finished at the rim. I do think as the year wore on, I got I got confident, I got better. Mm -hmm. I had some good moments, um, but you know, I, I, I it, it was it was sort of throwing me into the fire, and uh, mm -hmm. and I kind of survived it, and uh, and then towards the end, kind of, you know, was able to hold my own in certain moments, and so that was mm -hmm. that was a huge sort of, I don't know, I don't want to say a transitional year, but that was, I think that first year really kind of set the table for the next year. The next year, I came back, and I was off and running. Yeah, so were you handling the ball as a freshman? Were you going coast to coast or were you giving the ball to John? Um, I don't think I took more than two dribbles uh, yeah, at one yeah. time <laughs> my freshman year. Yeah, I was, yeah. I gave the ball to John and, and or Jerome yeah. and, um, mm -hmm. you know, and just, just sort of played my role, played my position. And um, yeah. now I will say um, that really helped because then, you know, that confidence of playing and, and getting through that year, we got, I think we were upset. We were upset by West Springfield and, uh, and Jim Warren. They beat us, um, and I don't know. I don't know if it was an upset or not. I know we won the Great Falls District. Um, you know, that team was, I mean, I guess we were a pretty good team. I mean, it was an upset because there were good teams in our district. Um, but mm -hmm. Jim Warren, you know, they ran that flex and all these cuts and things, mm -hmm. and we, we, uh, we had no answer for them. Uh, and so we lost that game. But when I went back to AU that summer between my freshman and sophomore year, now it's 14 and under, um, you know, we're playing in Seattle. And um, um, we ended up, you know, like I was dominant. Like I, I dominated that tournament. Um, and I think because I was playing with older kids all season and most of these kids were playing eighth, eighth grade ball, I think I had an advantage. Um, and we ended up losing in the finals. Um, mm. My guy Mark, Mark Meyer, unfortunately threw a like a, did a Freddie Brown where he threw the ball away, mm. and lost. But I still got MVP. Like I still got mm. MVP even though we lost. And so I really feel like that 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 period really kind of propelled me and said, okay, I, I'm, you know, I can be an elite player. You know, I can be on that sort of college trajectory. And uh, mm. and then like I said, from then I was I was off and running. Yeah, so the next year, uh, you know, Jerome is a major, major prospect. You know, Rob is, Rob is, uh, he's getting older and more experienced as well. So you had to be pretty confident going into your sophomore year that South Lakes is going to be a good team. Yeah, you know, um, you know, I felt like we had a chance. We had a chance to, to, to win. And, and, you know, I mean, I, you know, like I, I always feel like we have a chance to win. You always feel like you right. can win it all. And, uh, but I think having a season under my belt, you know, having, my own sort of personal development uh, over the summer, Jerome, you know, just continuing to get better and improve. Uh, and then, you know, Rob now is in the fold and, and, and Mike and David Jones and that whole crew. 
uh, who were now all juniors. Uh, and then we still had Chip Crawford and, and, and guys. So it, it just felt like, okay, wow, we have a chance to be special. And I, I still think, I know the junior year was a special team and we did some great things, but I, I feel like top to bottom, maybe my sophomore year, we were, that might've been the most talented team. Um, yeah. I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but, um, and, you know, Jerome was great because Jerome, you know, here he was a senior his last year. Uh, he didn't sign until late. So, you know, Coach Thompson and Georgetown and all these other schools were looking at him. But, you know, he, he allowed me to, to emerge and, 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 you know, and, and be great as well, you know. And he, mm. he was one of my, you know, big supporters and uh, always encouraged me. And, uh, and so, you know, we both were, I don't know, 22, 23 a game um that year and, and and I did start getting the ball and bringing it up and making plays and you know being an athlete dunking and just doing a lot of different things out there but Jerome was you know Jerome was a great great player super talented yeah. uh, I learned my crossover from Jerome like Jerome yes. the first person I remember who had like an in and out crossover yeah it's different. I used to watch him when he was a sophomore and I was in eighth grade I'd go home at night and be outside and, and on the street working on the crossover, trying to be like Jerome. Yeah. Um, but that team was was really talented, and we had some you know good players in the region. I remember Crawford Palmer, who was a McDonald's yeah. American. He was at W N L, you know Yorktown. With, you know I think Daryl Armstrong, Terrence Knuckles. You know those mm -hmm. guys were always good. Yeah. Um, so you know Herndon was always a, a big rival of ours, and. Um, yeah. That was that was a fun group. That was a fun group, and um, you know, unfortunately, we lost. We lost uh, again in the first round to uh, to Chantilly, um, and I remember uh, Peyton and, and and John Havy, I think, um, mm -hmm. had big games, and um, so that was disappointing. That was disappointing, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, would have been nice to you know kept hearing about Hubert Davis and Lake Braddock, and yeah. that team. Yeah. I never saw them play, but always hope that maybe we'd get a chance to see them down the road at some point. So uh, David Harris is over here the other day. He's a good friend of mine. You know, he's, he's an associate or assistant general counsel at SpaceX, actually general counsel at SpaceX now. And we're, we've been friends for a long time. I met him, Mike, playing pickup ball at, at UVA. And David said, you know, uh, you know, this 98, this 88 podcast that you did, uh, I'm going to let you know, we weren't, we weren't crying in the locker room. I don't know, I don't know what Russ Payton is talking about. So, you know, we did, we did the, uh, David said, oh, that, that did not. I saw that. So yeah, Daryl Branch yes. sent it for me. Daryl Branch sent hey, I, Yeah, like, okay, first of all, uh, and not, not to cut you off, I'm sorry. But I, I did you're good. And he said, like, we were crying. Like, first of all, I don't even, like, I don't even remember them being in our locker room. Like, and, and, and I'm not saying they weren't, but um, look, I have never cried after a game. Like, we, uh, in my last game at Duke, we lose in the finals. Uh, injury season in, like I've never like been in the locker room crying. So I know he wasn't talking about me. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember. Uh, I mean, there might've been disappointment and dejection, yeah. but uh, I don't remember. I don't remember one, like being in the same showers and all of that. Um, I do remember they beat us and, uh, yeah. and they never beat me again. Uh, I made sure of that, but uh, yeah. I don't remember the, 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 you know, but, but maybe it happened. Who knows? I don't recall that. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, so I, I talked to Russ, I talked to Russ this week because I said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to Grant. He said, yeah, they, they, got, they got us back the next year. He said, and they, and they wanted to make sure they got us back next year at every opportunity. He said, Rob Robinson, nicest guy in the world. That dude turned your head, he, he would elbow you, he, would, he was so tricky, but you would, you would leave the game beat up. And Rob was such a nice guy, he's smiling, never get any fouls called on him. He said, you make sure Rob Robinson knows he beat me up. He beat me up the next year. <laughs> yeah, no, no, Rob, you know, it's funny, Rob, <laughs> Rob, um, Rob, Rob was and, and, and is a great guy. Um, and yeah. Rob had- a, I didn't mean that person. I didn't mean that personally. Oh, no, 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 he was I mean, Rob, like, you know, Rob was athletic. He was physical. He had swagger. He had personality, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say he was underrated, but he kind of just, you know, I think with Jerome and myself, um, Rob didn't really, I don't even know if Rob started as a junior. I think Rob came mm. off the bench and I think that just wow. sort of spoke to how good we were. But, yeah. you know, his senior year, I thought he really showed what he was capable of. And he was dominant. 
uh, my numbers actually came down. I think I was at 22, 23 as a sophomore. I might've been 17 or 18 as a junior. Mm. And a lot of that was, we were really deep. A lot of it was mm-hmm. Rob. Like Rob was, was really yeah. talented, really good. Um, and Rob would hit you, you know, Rob, you know, and, and, and be physical and, and talk trash and, and all of that. And so, um, but yeah, I, don't, I, I think yeah. we, played, we might've played them three times, maybe four yeah. times that year. Four times, four times, yeah. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember that those particular games, but I know, I know we never we never lost to them again. And uh, no, but they they were you know Coach Martino was a great coach, and those were some really talented teams. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we 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 made sure that we we took care of business from then on. Rob reminds me of kind of a Harvey Horace Grant type of player. You know, kind of he'll slash in there. He he can, he can pop up and shoot, and he's. He's very he's very agile around, around the whole. You know, he's not as tall as those guys, but that's that's what he kind of reminded me of at least. Um, so so the next the next year the team is going to change dramatically because you got um, uh, uh, Jerome Jerome has graduated and um, you got you got you got some speed coming in. You got Ellison, you got Michael Taylor coming in. You got Gib- you got Gibson. Um, it was a, it was a different it was a, it was probably the smallest team you had at, at your time there. You and Robert both tall. But uh, it was it was a, it was a smaller team that year. You know it was. I mean, <clears throat> I, I kind of slid over the center. I was you know I'm six eight. Rob was six six. Uh, you know Chip Crawford, who was there before, he was six ten. So I played two years with Chip. Um, mm-hmm. We were a tall team, like you said, my first two years, tall and athletic. Uh, and then we were we were smaller. We trapped a lot. Um, you know we had multiple guys who could play. We had guys on the bench who who could come in, and, and we, we were. I think there were only two juniors on the team, myself and Josh Harwood, uh, Quinn Harwood's older brother, and then everyone mm-hmm. else was a senior. Um, but I think I think that team was 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 connected. You know, that team was was really close, and, and maybe the closest yeah. team that I that I was on. Uh, we you know we we all hung out. We were all friends. We you know we would we would go up to the to the Tyson's uh, Sports Club, and you know somehow mm-hmm. somebody sneak in. And then we would go up there and like we'd run our plays. Like literally in the summer, we'd go up there. We're playing against old men, and we we'd press and we'd run our sets and we would just run the court and just for, you know for the fun of it. But um, but that team, you know, I think I think when you spend a lot of time with one another off the court and you build trust uh, and you build you know um, uh, just a real bond, it, it really carries over onto the court. And so oh, yeah. we could talk to each other crazy. We, you know, we could do all these things because we, we really knew each other and we knew where it was coming from. And uh, so that was, that was a fun team and that was a fun year. And, um, you know, we, um, I can't remember what our record was. I know we were, I want to say we were ranked maybe number one in, in, in Northern Virginia, maybe number one in, in, in the DC area for a good portion. I believe of so. And we took pride, like we, we, you know, across the street or down the road at Flint Hill. I mean, they, they were loaded. They had, I think that year they had, they had George Lynch, Aaron Bain, Randolph mm. Jones, and Corey Alexander. Wow. And so you know, all those guys were, were great high school players and went on and, you know, three of them played in the NBA for a while. But we felt like we were better. You know, we felt mm. like we could beat them and, and, and that was sort of our attitude. And uh, so even though we had talent, I, I think the sum of the parts were greater than the whole. And uh, I think our our connectivity is what really made us, um, you know, a really, a really good team. So I followed you guys that year. So you you guys beat Chantilly in the regional final, uh, uh, put Russell, put Russell down. And then you guys went down to state. I believe it was in Richmond the first time you went to state and you guys played. It was a good state tournament because Chantilly was going to play Petersburg and Kenny Harris. And you um, and you and you guys were going to play. I think it was Highland Springs. You start out. I think it was. uh, I think it was Highland Springs and you guys, uh, Rob Robinson went crazy the first game. Yeah. I think he had 30 points. Um, and you guys just, you guys destroyed them, but that the, the Chantilly Petersburg game was a game for the ages. I mean, it was, I think three or four overtimes. Ken Harris had 37 points. I mean, he, he, he did not sign with Carolina until late, but I can't say what are these guys waiting for? I mean, he was an unbelievable high school player. Um, so I really enjoyed that state tournament. And then, but well, Chantilly loses, and you guys get to the semifinals, and you play against Hampton. Mm-hmm. And I, I believe Hampton was a defending. I don't know they weren't they weren't defending champs. I don't believe, but they, they had a bruising team. They had uh, this guy named Gannon Baker. 
who uh, shot both hands, yeah. three pointers uh, with both hands in a game. Uh, and they had a guy that I, I became close with because he played football at UVA, Aaron Monday. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I played pickup, not pickup, but adult leagues with him around here after he graduated. Nice guy. Aaron Monday was an old school post player. I mean, yeah. he was six seven. He was like two eighty. He would put that drop step, that shoulder into you, and it was funny. It, it was a, it was a great game. I mean, it wasn't like you guys weren't in it. And I think, actually, I think you guys missed some foul shots, and or the game might have been close. I think we, we I think, I said we because I was cheering for you. I think you, you missed. We missed a couple, you know, one on ones. But I mean, I think that team was so physical and I'm not sure you get quite that kind of team in Northern Virginia. No, I think you're right. Um, I think Aaron Monday, there was a guy, I think Eric Hunter, who was uh, yeah. on that team, football. Who played football mm -hmm. at Purdue. Like that team was a bunch of football players who could hoop, you know, and, and that doesn't always happen. But, you know, they would, they mm -hmm. would just, I mean, we had like, I know Charlie Garner, um, you know, he, he was obviously a great football player. And, and, mm -hmm. and Charlie used to pick, you know, my senior year, he used to pick me up full court and just try to beat me up. And he's like, you know, 5'11". Yeah. Um, but those guys were like, you know, Aaron was like 6'8", 260, 270. Eric, Eric Hunter, I mean, these guys were just, you know, it was like, what's in the water down here in, uh, in Florida, yeah. Virginia? And so I don't remember the particulars of the game. I do remember it was mm -hmm. close. But I remember like... Mm -hmm. Russell Payton felt like, you know, he got beat up by Rob. Like, I felt like <laughs> they were physically imposing. And, you know, we were all long and lanky. And, and, and you know, and, and, you know, we had a, a toughness about us. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, they just, you know, and I knew Gannon. I mean, Gannon, I, I played with at camps at Five Star. So I knew Gannon and knew what he was capable of. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they, they were the better team. And I think they went on and they beat us and went on and won the state. Um, yeah, they won it. And so that was, um, that was, that was, but I remember that. That, that was a great team. And, and it was, that was a, a tough moment, I think, um, you know, just sort of coming to the realization that, that those guys, you know, these were many of those guys I've been playing with since, you know, since, you know, since uh, grade school, you know, now like mm -hmm. you get a chance to play with them again. And so it was kind of the finality of, of our run was, was, you know, came to an end and, uh, or the finality mm -hmm. of all of this, was uh, was tough, but yeah, no Hampton man, they they were you know, they they were you know, it was a it, it was a different. I don't know what it's like in high school ball now. You know, I know in the NBA it was more physical in the '90s. It's a little less physical now, but that was that was like Detroit Piston bad boy. You know, early '90s New York Knicks. I mean, they just they beat you up, and um, you know, yeah. they, but they they deserved to win. They were the better team. Yeah. Well, then the next the next year, it's, it's going to be uh, 80, 89, 90. You completely retold the team. And this is this is going to be one of the greatest, most talented teams in the history of the Northern region. It's not going to be, again, I don't think you're, I think you're right. And my, my, my point of view is the chemistry was better in your junior year. But now you're going to bring in Joey Beard. You're going to, you're going to have two big time outside shooters with three one Curry and, and Howard Hogan. Um, so this, this team is going to be very hard for anyone to match up with. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if we saw that right away. Um, I think mm -hmm. as that school year began and you, know, you saw Howard, you saw Theron, how they had developed and, and certainly, um, you know, were ready for, for, you know, they played JV the year before, you know, and now they're juniors and, and they, you could see, okay, these guys are good. Joey, um, you know, was so young, but he was six, eight as a freshman and, um, and had, you know, could run, um, you know, I, I went to school, his older sister was in my class. So I had known Joey since, you know, he was in kindergarten, you know, we, we, and, and so I've known Joey for a long time. And, um, but you could see, okay, Joey was emerging and had a chance to, to, to maybe do what I was doing, you know, play as a freshman, kind of learn the ropes, be a part of it, get better as the year went on. Uh, and then Josh Harwood was the other senior and Josh. Oh, that's right, Josh. Yeah. Josh Quinn's older brother. Josh didn't play much his junior year. So, you know, four new starters, you know, four new starters, but, you know, Theron was about six, five, six, six. Had was Howard. We called him Had. Had was mm -hmm. about six, three. Um, so, and, and, you know, the three point shot, I think kind of came in maybe a year or two before. I don't mm -hmm. think it was here my freshman year, maybe my sophomore year. It was your freshman year, but 
Your first freshman year was the first year of three pointers. Okay, first. So like Had mm -hmm. and Devon like became long distance bombers. Like they they came in and, and had range. And, and I, I don't know if we ever really had guys prior to that who who really shot the ball um, with that kind of efficiency from long range. Um, and then, you know, and then we were tall, you know, I mean, I, I was playing point guard, like Wendell said, hey, I'm gonna put the ball in your hands or Wendell, Coach Bird. Um, and, um, and so I, you know, I, I handled the ball. And so we were tall, we were athletic, we ran, um, we had, you know, good shooting. We, you know, we had interior play. We, you know, we, we had, we had good balance. We didn't have a lot of depth. That was probably our one, one problem, but um, our starting five was was as talented as any starting five. And um, I think as the year went on, you know, Howard, Deron, uh, they really emerged and came into their own. And then you know, Joey was was getting better, getting stronger, more confident. You know, Josh was a serviceable kind of role player. So um, it, it was kind of shaping up early on. Like I think we went down to Myrtle Beach and, and played down the Beach Ball Classic and. You know, we I think we won two, we lost one, but you know, that was kind of like a, a litmus test for us. Like, okay, we, we, we're we're actually not pretty bad, and we're pretty we're actually really good, and we got a chance to do something special this year. And the thing that uh, was really difficult for teams uh, to play, to deal with 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 South Lakes was the one three one zone, because you had you had so much size, and then they put you up top of that one three one zone, and you had Joey and, and we had Harwood as well, and you had you Howard and and you on our athletic guys. So that, that zone was very difficult for teams to manage. It was. I mean, you know, one of our greatest strengths, I think, that year was our length. And we could, you know, we could shrink the court a lot of times, um, particularly whether it was a full court press or that sort of one three zone, one three one zone, uh, or even, you know, a two three. I, I don't know if we were a great man to man defensive team. I thought the year before our man to man defense was better, if I'm, if I'm recalling correctly. But that zone, you know, we got our hands out and extended. Uh, we, we took up a lot of space. And, uh, you know, Howard, our, our shortest guy, he was 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, I mean, he was our shooting guard. And so, um, so yeah, no, we weren't big. We weren't like, you know, you know, we weren't big and imposing, but we were long and lanky. And, uh, and, I, and that definitely served us well. Yeah. So, you know, the regional tournament, and you alluded to this earlier, it was a very special uh, environment. So I, I, you know, I went to Robinson, so they had the tournament there every year. So I grew up going to regionals and, you know, I just, I couldn't wait for the final four every year. At, at one point they had even the round earlier rounds at Robinson and I'd watch every minute. And, and my sister was a, was a all met player at Robinson. So I was, I was steeped in the regional tradition and I, and I, and, you know, we have 6,000 people there and I don't think the crowds were ever bigger than it was when you were there. It, was, it had the atmosphere of a Mike Tyson fight when you guys would come onto, onto the court, 6,000 strong. So I, I remember the regional game, it was electric and you guys were gonna play Stewart in the semifinals. And as you said, you're, you, you mentioned Charlie Garner before. Stewart had two incredible guards. It, uh, Charlie was an incredible athlete, but a good guard. And Donnell White was just a tremendous point guard, great passer, you know, long range shooter. And they had a guy named Walter Wright that could just fill it up. So, so this is a, a very, you know, uh, very exciting matchup. You got a really small team against a very tall team. And they, they jumped on you guys early. I mean, they got it by 12 points in the second quarter. And I remember saying, is, is this going to happen? And then right before halftime, Theron went crazy. And he got, I think, I think he had like three or four three-pointers right before the half, maybe the last two minutes. So you guys go in the locker room, and I'm sure, sure it had to be a relief. Do you have any recollection of that game? You know, I don't. I don't remember. I mean, I, look, I know Darnell. I played against Darnell many, many times, and he was. Oh, you did. He was really a great point guard. Um, and I might have even played against him back when, when we were, you know, select basketball back, you know, before high school. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think he's he was an underrated kind of guy that people don't. When we, when we look back and talk about great players in Northern Virginia, you know, people. Well, maybe they do remember, but I, I always thought he was really talented. And then, you know, Stewart. They, they were little, but they were they were tough and they were strong. And I remember like Charlie Garner, like, you know, it, it, he was a tough matchup because yeah. um, even though he was little, he would get under me and he was quick enough to move his feet, but strong enough to where I couldn't sort of physically impose him. And so I didn't post up a lot. I, I kind of just, you know, played with the ball and tried to drive. And, and so he was hard to get by. Um, 
I don't remember the game. All I remember, I remember Theron. Theron might have had thirty or thirty-five or something. Some yeah, big yeah. And, um, yeah, big, big, big. But yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember the particular. I don't even remember getting down like that. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I don't remember all, all, all the all the, the the details. But um, <laughs> I remember, obviously, we won the game. And um, but that was, you know, I think, I think. Um, I, I think it was sort of an example of that simplified sort of the season, how guys just got better and got, you know, throughout the course of the year and, um, and kind of came, I, th- I even think Joey had some really good moments uh, either mm-hmm. in that game or in, in the final four. Uh, and to think sort of where Joey and Theron were at the beginning and then how they grew and, and, and developed and evolved, um, you know, was, was, was a credit to, to them, credit to coach bird. Um, and, you know, just, kind of where we were, you know, as a team where it wasn't, it wasn't a one man team, you know, it was a collective mm. group. And, um, and so, but I remember after that game, like Theron like went off, like he, he was always a good shooter, but like now, instead of making two, three, three pointers in a game, like he might've made five or six, seven, three. I mean, he, he got really, really hot at the right time. And, and, and thankfully he did. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, well, we, 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 we do polls on the, our, on our group, uh, the Nova Legends group. And, you know, voted one of the greatest upsets in Northern region history, maybe it was the number one, was the Wakefield game. And, uh, you know, it was, it was an unbelievable game, great matchup. They had Kenya Hunters, point guard, current assistant coach, I believe, at UConn. Um, and they had Travis Spencer. They had, they had a nice team. And they had a, uh, the way they played, uh, they played the Louisville uh, high-low game. And they, would, they would pound the ball inside. So it was going to be an interesting matchup. Um, going into that game, I mean, obviously you're always confident, but did you, did you think Wakefield was on your level did you, going into the game? Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think. I think we played them the year before. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe did we, I, I want to say we played them the year before in the regionals. Um, yeah, you, you may have. Yeah, man, mm-hmm. I, I can't remember. But we definitely had played them a number of times. You know, I, I think we even might have had a jamboree or some sort of scrimmage with them my junior year. So I knew Kenya real well um, and that team. Um, I think at that point, yeah, I mean, I think at that point, you know, you, you, know you, you realize that when you go, when you try to advance, there's always going to be that like one game where, you know, you got you to gotta show some grit and some toughness and sort of overcome. And, you know, maybe that was that Stewart game where, you know, as you said, we get down, we come back, we win. Okay, we got that one, you know, if you can win in a tournament while playing bad, you know, because you're going to maybe have one of those games. And so um, I, I think we were, you know, respectful, but also confident that, that you know, we played our game, um, you know, that we could beat them, you know. And, um, and, uh, and so I think, you know, I think we felt that about everybody, you know, at that point. I, mean, I think we felt that we could beat everybody. And so, um, and so clearly we were wrong, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and, and I did see the episode where they, they, um, they talked about it a little bit. Well, yeah, was it, did they have an episode or was that, that might have been? Uh, they, they, uh, that's uh, Buck, and, Buck and Tony. Tony's the coach, current coach Tony. Victor. Yeah, Tony, they played had, they had WNL, nice... Tony played a WNL, right? He played WL, but he coaches the Wakefield. But they had an episode about about that game. Yeah. And what is, it, is, is there something in your contract where Tony has to be on every episode? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To, 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 Tony is great. He is great in front of a camera. I mean, he's just got that personality to him. Yeah. 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 Tony back in high school. Tony used to come up and work my camp in Detroit when I was up there in oh. the 90s. So. Uh, I'm glad he's doing very well and had great success. But yeah. now that Wakeful team was tough. They were experienced, um, well coached. Um, I want to say they played a lot of zone uh, in that game, but I, I can't I can't remember yeah. all the details. But mm-hmm. um, now that was you know back then they took two to the states, and so That's right. you know you were short of going. But um, I think. You know, I think we, you know, we obviously wanted that, that that regional final. We I, I wanted to upstage, you know, Rob and those guys, uh, and, and, and have another one. And uh, and so we we were you know totally locked in and focused. And um, but I, like I said, I can't remember all the details. I tend to flush yeah. the losses more than the victories. Um, yeah. But I, I did yeah. know it was a disappointment for sure after that game, and we felt like you know 
we felt like, you know, we, you know, we, um, you know, they got us. We didn't have our best moment, and, uh, mm. and that unfortunately happens. Yeah. Well, anyway, I know uh, so I don't tax your memory too much. You guys get, get to the States, as you said, it's in Williamsburg and you guys play Potomac. And I did a podcast with Coach Hayes, a uh, great guy, great coach. And he was, I think it was one of his first couple of years of coaching. They had BJ Hawkins and they said they got up on you guys at first half. But again, you guys came roaring back. And I think you won pretty easily. The second game though, you, here's Hampton all over again. So you got, you got Gannon Baker and Aaron again, and then uh, they have a Scott Lonnie man, uh, uh, kind of big ball guy. And again, they, it was, it was the same thing. You guys, uh, they just kind of beat you up again. Uh, no, they did. They did. I, I remember, yeah, yeah. I want to say we, I remember there was, I remember, <laughs> I remember this. I don't know if it was at halftime. I think it was at halftime and guys couldn't figure out if Gannon was like right-handed or left-handed. And I remember we were playing the zone and, and Gannon just kept, he would go to the one side of the court and was just knocking down threes left and right. I remember that. Um, I don't really, like I said, I don't remember all the details, but um, yeah. they, they, they were, you know, I think what one of our advantages up until then was that we were, you know, we were big and athletic and it felt like they were just, they were bigger and more athletic and, um, and, uh, and, and just had a lot of depth. You know, I felt like they yeah. came at you in waves. They picked you up full court, made you work for everything you got. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I, I know, I know I had a, a decent game, I guess, maybe a good first quarter, first half or a good second half. I can't remember, but, um, you know, it was, it, it was, it was probably one of the first times that I think we, we played, we played a team in Virginia where it was like, okay, like, they're just as good, if not better, you know, Wakefield, like you said, it was an upset. We felt like we were better than them. You know, were we overconfident? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, they won, which, you know, very deserving, but like, that was like that game. It was like, okay, like we got to strap it on because this team, you know, was just as good or if not better. And, uh, and, you know, they showed it, they beat us. They, and, but they were physical, they were physical and they had been champions, you know? And, and so they had a lot of guys back from that team. I just feel like there's a, there's a know-how, there's an understanding, there's a confidence, yeah. you know, when, when you've won it, when you as a core group have gone through the fire and come out and now you bring a lot of that group back. Um, and for a lot of us, this, you know, other than me, I guess it was sort of the first time on, on that stage, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't, we didn't get the job done. They did. Uh, that still yeah. haunts me. That haunts me more than the Chantilly laws, like to, to lose to the same team twice in the state yeah. semifinals. Um, you know, that's something that, you know, you, if you could go back and, and, and do one thing or two things, you know, from my high school years, it would be, you know, to go back and replay those games. This is what is amazing about the great athletes that I've talked to. Um, even the ones that have gone very far, they still remember the high school losses. It's just amazing how they, those games stay with them. It, it, no matter if they play in Europe and the NBA, travel the world, those high school losses stick with them, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, it does. I, I think, you know, I, I can't speak for everybody. Um, I think in general, whether high school, college, NBA, I think for me, the losses hurt more than, than the wins uh, feel good. You know, like the, the loss from, from a, you know, from the, the feeling of dejection of a loss is greater than, you know, the excitement from a win. And um, yeah. Like later That's on, like we won we won two championships in college. You know, the 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 disappointment of losing in the finals my senior year like is greater than than the excitement of winning those first two. Mm -hmm. So That's certainly surprised with Hampton and uh, and I guess I, I've seen you know I've seen Gannon you know and and uh, and all the great things that he's done, and um, you know I still look at him sideways because uh, you know his <laughs> team his teams uh, be wild, but you know it is what it is. Yeah. Well, so you end up, uh, you know, at a, a little college that, that they call Duke in North Carolina, you end up going there. I know, uh, I know Georgetown was in the mix. I know UVA was in the, was in the mix. Uh, and uh, I think there's, there was, uh, North Carolina was in the mix. Why, why, did, you, why did you choose Duke? And, and Michigan, you know, Michigan was in the mix um, too. I was big, big, um, like I said, I was a fan of guys who, who were versatile, who were tall. So I was a big fan of Sean Higgins. 
who was on, on that right. team, on championship team. Um, mm -hmm. And then up at the, actually up at the, the Tyson Sports Club, uh, met Ramil Robinson. He was up there one time. And mm -hmm. so um, wow. I might have been a sophomore or junior uh, in high school. But anyway, I, I was, those were the five schools. You know, grew up a Georgetown fan. Everybody, you know, I think in D.C. was, was a Georgetown fan back in the 80s. Michael went to Georgetown right after South Lakes. We ended up getting Georgetown season tickets in part to follow Michael. You know, and, and that started their incredible run, uh, which led to a championship in 84. Um, you know, the first the first game I ever watched, um, college game, was was the, the Georgetown Carolina game uh, in the 82 championship. And so kind of from that moment on, I, I, I followed those two schools uh, and both of them had great runs, you know, from that moment on. And so those were, you know, those were the schools that 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 I kind of favored. Um, Obviously, Duke kind of was emerging. Tommy Amaker, Johnny Dawkins, uh, was familiar with you know Johnny at Mackin, Tommy at WT Woodson, uh, and so watching Duke you know get to the '86 Finals uh, right when I was entering high school, so that Duke kind of was you know gaining some some momentum, and then you know you know Virginia, I mean Ralph Sampson, you know, and a lot of people you know from from South Lake went to went to you know went to um, went to Virginia. Um, Virginia, actually, you may not know this. So Virginia was in the mix. I'm not sure I would have gone there, but um, so all of my buddies, you know, all my friends from high school went to Virginia. Uh, you know, girl I was kind of, you know, was dating my, my junior year, no, excuse me, like right going into my senior year, she was going to, to, to Virginia. She was older than me. I was down there. I was down there for their freshman orientation, and you know, in, in Mike Ellison's class. Like, I was down there that whole week. I was in Virginia all the time. Virginia, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they announced in the in the in the summer of '89 that Terry Holland, who was then the coach, the upcoming season was going to be his last year. But I, I think that's right. Yeah. I don't. I don't think they announced who his replacement was going to be. And so when I'm making my decision. In September of '89, you know, I don't know who's going to be the coach, and so I almost feel like Virginia eliminated themselves. And I remember I was at UVA for like two weekends in a row. Then I made my official visit to Duke um, the following weekend. Committed to Duke, maybe like on a Wednesday, the Wednesday or Thursday afterwards. Then I was back down at UVA that that next. Week. <laughs> so wow. I, was, I was at Virginia a lot. Um, but you know, Duke, you know, it, it really became Duke, Carolina, and, and probably Georgetown, and um, those were the, the three schools. Um, and I think, you know, I was a huge Dean Smith fan. Um, you know, loved his program. Um, but Coach K, there was just something about Coach K. Uh, he was having success. He was getting to the Final Fours. Um, and as we began to, to get to know each other and the recruiting process. You know, he, he, he has a lot of, you know, a lot of strengths, I think, that, um, that, are why, that, that are reasons why he's had great success. But his ability to connect with people and his ability to, to, to get you to believe and buy in is just incredible. And, um, and so, like, he recruited me. You know, I think other schools maybe recruited me, recruited my parents. You know the whole like he he recruited me and um, and just made me believe that okay wow like if I come here you know this will happen for us this will happen for me and you know pretty much everything he said ended up happening you know I mean it was it was but it was just the right fit I mean he he's an incredible coach an incredible leader he's a relationship guy he knows how to you know he knows how to make you know connect connect with each individual and understand each individual is different and what that person needs. Uh, to be successful. And, you know, Leitner, Hurley, Brian Davis, Thomas Hill, all different individuals. And, um, uh, and then of course, Tommy Amaker. Tommy Amaker was, um, you know, he was, he was an assistant coach. He was sort of the lead recruiter. Um, and I was a big fan of Tommy uh, and, you know, Billy King, um, you know, who's from around the way as well. Actually, there's a, there's a real healthy pipeline of, of yeah. North DMV guys um, mm. 
for the Duke program. I mean, you know, Coach Johnny Dawkins, Tommy Amaker, you know, Billy King, you know, a lot of guys came through here. But um, yeah, I mean, it just it was the right fit, and I knew, and I didn't take any other any other visits. I didn't go visit Carolina. I didn't visit Georgetown, um, and it felt right, and and it ended up being right. Mm. So I, I was doing uh, research on the parade all Americans from the Northern region and also Virginia, um, you know, in the history of Northern region basketball. And, you know, I, I realized that you were, you were third team all, all American parade, parade all American, and there's 10 players per team. So I thought about it for a while. I said, that means there was at least 20 players that they were more highly rated than Grant in high school. So I, I went through those 20 players, maybe two or three of them ever had an impact in the NBA, maybe. So it's, you know, I, my recollection is that you were always so highly rated. But when I went back and saw that, I was surprised that, you know, you were, you were third team parade all, all, all American. I mean, this is coming from a guy who only averaged four points a game in, in high school, but I was still surprised. So then you, you go to Duke and Duke had a great program. Uh, you know, when, when I was in school, um, you know, Duke was, they were very tough. I got to the final four a few times when I was an undergrad. Um, but they never quite get over the hump. In, seven, in 76, they, they had great teams. They always had a great program, but they just couldn't get over the hump. I mean, but you absolutely hit the ground running, uh, the floor running when you got to Duke. I mean, uh, it, it seemed like there was no adjustment for you at all. You seemed to be completely comfortable from the moment you got into the ACC. Well, it, it may have seemed that way. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> that way. No, I mean, I think, you know, you know, Duke had had a great run of success. 86 Final Four championship game, 88 Final Four, 89 Final Four, 90, you know, like just couldn't get over the hump, like you said. And um, and then that team from 90, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm writing a book and I, I don't I don't want to give all the stuff away, but <laughs> the moment when, you know, our first our first official sort of team meeting, the first day of school. And this year's team, the 9091 team, my freshman year, we're all assembled. We're in the locker room and coach puts on the board national champions uh, and, and 1991 national champions. And I'm looking at him like he's crazy. Like I'm thinking, okay, you got UNLV who has everybody back from last year's national championship team. That's a great team. I remember watching the. I was at I was at Quinn Harwood's. I was at Josh Josh Harwood and Quinn Harwood's house, and I was just like, like, uh, like the way UNLV beat Duke in that game. I was like almost violating. Like it just felt like it, it was so bad. I I couldn't believe it. I was stunned. So when Coach K said that, and he's talking about we're going to be national champ, I'm looking around the locker room. Now that team had three senior starters: Allah Abdenabi, Phil Henderson, mm -hmm. Rob Ricky. They all graduated. I'm looking at Bobby Hurley, who's now a sophomore, Christian's a junior, and then a bunch of new faces, a lot of freshmen, uh, upperclassmen who, who were role players. And so I didn't quite see where Coach K, like what he was saying, and was really making any sense. Um, but, I, but I think the, the one thing that, that I think I brought to the table that that previous Duke team didn't have was just sort of the versatility. You know, I think to being able to handle the basketball, being able to to, to do a number of different things on the court. I, I, I don't know if Duke had had that before. You know, Bobby was the main ball handler, um, you know, his freshman year, but no one else really, really could do that. Now I came in as another point guard and really was a backup point guard to Bobby uh, for three years. I mean, I, I was essentially a backup point guard. So, um, but yeah, I mean, we got better as the year we're on. I mean, I, I did assert myself early. I was, I started from day one. Uh, I think I gained confidence. You know, it's one thing to play in the preseason. Uh, it's another thing to get into ACC regular season. You know, Coach K scheduled some really tough non-conference opponents. So we played Arkansas, Notre Dame, we played Georgetown. We went to Oklahoma where they had a, you know, a winning streak at home. Uh, went to Arizona. So we, we had a tough schedule that first year. But as the year wore on and, and as we got to the second half of the ACC regular season, you know, we kind of, we kind of found our stride, you know, and um, I don't know if I still thought we'd be, you know, national champions at that point, but um, you started to, to realize, okay, we, we have a chance to be really, really good, really special. I remember the first time I saw you play in college, 
it was during semester break and you were playing UVA. So I drove, I drove down because I wanted to see you guys play UVA. I think it was like, uh, it might've been bad weather that day, but I got down there and it was, uh, some of the UVA teams didn't have the best chemistry uh, in those years, but this team had two of my favorite players. They had John Crotty and they had Brian Stiff. And I used to ball with them in the gym. I mean, these guys play hard every moment they're on the court. They, they're just like two warriors. I mean, they are, and they're just ballers. I love those guys. So, you know, they, they got they got the best of you that day. Um, you got them back a couple times at least. Uh, after that game, did you wonder, you know what, maybe I, sh- maybe I should have gone to UVA. Nah, so, you know, <laughs> that was uh, my first ACC game. And uh, I want to say it was maybe late December, early January. Um, and um, so a couple of things. One, we were up that night in the hotel room, like fighting. <laughs> we were in we were in Leitner's room and we moved the beds apart and wrestling and fighting and a bunch of us and the manager came and, you know, whatever. I mean, I, you know, I'm sure Coach K or the coaches heard about it, but we came out there and UVA just smacked us. They might've beat us by, I don't know what the score was, but it felt like they beat us by like 20, 25 points and just embarrassed us. And so we got on the bus and um, we drove back to Durham and there was not a word said on the bus. And we got there, Coach K said, I want everybody taped and ready in 15 minutes. And so we got off the bus and we practiced. And it was Mm -hmm. the worst practice (laughs) that I ever had in in my four years at Duke. And Mm -hmm. if if, if the offense scored, the defense had to run. If if the offense (laughs) scored, they had to run. And in that practice, I went up to try to dunk it on my roommate, uh, Tony Lang. And he tried to block it and ended up hitting me in the face and I broke my nose. Mm. Blood went everywhere. Oh, jeez. Oh, um, it was a long day. <laughs> it was a long, yeah. long day. Uh, eventually mm. had to have surgery on it, wear the mask and everything for, for a couple of weeks. Um, but, you know, one thing I didn't know at the time, and I know I'm getting off subject, but I guess there was an, and, and maybe you were at UVA at the time, but there was an ACC game uh, maybe ACC tournament game where Duke played against Virginia and um, uh, Virginia beat Duke by like 40 or 50 points. And, mm. uh, and Ralph Sampson was there and that whole, you know, those great teams. And mm. I think Johnny and those guys were freshmen, Johnny Dawkins, Mark mm. Allery, Jay Billis. And I've heard John Feinstein tell this story. So afterwards, Feinstein and Coach K and a few others go to a Denny's um, and I guess, you know, Feinstein raises a glass of orange juice and to toast, like, here's to forgetting this night. And then coach says, no, here's to never forgetting this night. And so from that moment on, Duke never lost to Virginia. And mm. I, uh, now I might be wrong, I, you know, I want to check that, but I think from that moment on, like Duke had an incredible run where they did not lose at all to UVA. And then of mm. course we lose this game and we lose by 25. Yeah. So. Coach yeah. was mad, and uh, but it, it really kind of it, it really was an eye opener for me. It set the tone that you know, look, ACC basketball is competitive. You know, teams know each other. They understand. They're not they're not intimidated. They know each other's style. We had had some good wins prior to that, but now you know you have to roll up your sleeves and, and really kind of get dirty uh, and, and and play with a little bit more toughness, and uh, and so. You know, that team was learning and growing and, and trying to become what it was going to ultimately become. But that loss played a role in that because it really just sort of forced us to like, OK, we're not there yet. And uh, we got to get back to, to you know, to, to establishing who we want to be and how we're going to play. And what we did against Virginia, that didn't cut it. Yeah, as, as a UVA guy, you know, we, we hate uh, you might have heard me tell Tommy this, but we, we hated UNC and Virginia Tech. Bas- Tech was a great basketball program uh, b- before before the 80s. They were really good. So that's who we hated in, in basketball. We didn't hate Duke. You know, Duke was not really on our radar. The guys that played at Duke were really good dudes when I was there. They had, you know, they had Tommy and they had uh, Johnny Dogs. We all like there was Dan Moore was a little colorful before, but generally the Duke players were cool. But 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 when you got there, uh, you, you were playing with some characters. So you had Al Donabi. He, uh, you know, some the crowd wouldn't like him so much. And then, you know, Leitner and Davis, they really didn't care whether people liked them or not. That was just kind of like their thing. 
And it was just so funny how in my, in my seven years uh, at UVA, uh, also with your success, I'm sure that didn't help us like you guys anymore. You went from being, you know, just a team that, hey, Duke's a pretty solid team to being like absolutely notorious in those seven years. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. I mean, I, I, I think that's accurate. Um, I, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I think we were, I don't know if we were so insulated or, you know, in, I hate to use the word bubble in, in, in this time of COVID, but like in a, in a little bit of a, of a, of a bubble in, in, in a way, because um, obviously now, I mean, there's documentaries and, you know, we talk about, you know, what people thought of Duke and the perception of Duke and whether they loved or hated Duke. Um, but we were kind of insulated from that in a sense. And, and what I mean mm -hmm. by that is, you know, I had like, I was close with Corey Alexander and, and Junior Burroughs. I was close with mm -hmm. James Forrest, and Travis Best at Georgia Tech, Sharon Wright at Clemson, Sam Cassell and, and that whole crew down in Florida State, uh, The Wiz, Walt, and Kevin McClendon, like all these guys, like they, they were my guys. We, we, you know, we'd hang out, we'd, we'd talk, we'd, you know, we'd, we'd call each other, and, you know, we, we we, we had a friendship. Um, um, that wasn't necessarily the case. Oh, Randolph Childress at, uh, at Wake Forest. We played AAU ball together back in the day. So, um, and Rodney Rogers as well. We just didn't like Carolina. Like that's who we didn't like. And, and Carolina, when I got there, I felt like, you know, it's kind of like living with the enemy. And, you know, you're, you're seven miles apart, this heated rivalry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could be in the cafeteria line and one of the attendants, uh, the checkout was a Tar Heel fan. And, you know, at Duke, you know, and, and talking trash, oh, y'all ain't, ain't gonna be Carolina and blah. And so you, like, it, was, it was fun, it was great, but it was, it was just a, it was a rivalry. And one of the things that was interesting and I, and I kind of regret, but Brian Reese, who was, was from New York, um, went, to, went to Carolina, he and I were in the same class. And he and I were good friends. You know, I'd been up to, 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 you know, to see him hang out in the Bronx. He had been down to Reston. Um, actually, one time he came down and, and, and he and Chris Weber were at my house. We were all in high school. Uh, I'll save all that for my book. But um, so we get to, <laughs> get to Duke. I get down to Duke and I go over to Carolina for a freshman orientation party. And I see Brian. He sees me and we don't speak. And we literally didn't speak for like four years. And um, wow. and. One time he came by our apartment uh, my sophomore year, and I think he was trying to extend an, an olive branch. And Tony Lang was my roommate, and I remember Rodney Rogers was was he's from Durham, so he was at our apartment. And Brian came over, and we, we you know, he was there for like an hour or so, and and but it was just like, why is he here? Like you know, what is he trying? You know, it was instead of reciprocating, it was just kind of you know sort of questioning sort of his intentions. And uh, and so I say all that to say like that was the extent of our rivalry, but, you know, I don't know, like I, I always felt, yeah, okay, when we went places, we got booed, you know, and a lot of that was, was towards Christian, who I thought embraced it. Like Christian, I thought he like enjoyed playing this, like, you know, wrestling villain character. Uh, he embraced it. Come to find out years later, it bothered him, but, you know, we thought he really? made a tough yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, in the 30 for 30, where he talked about some of the, the, the things that the taunting and, you know, things mm -hmm. of that nature, like, I, I thought that, you know, he, he, he embraced it, he, he it gave him fuel. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, I think it did bother him, but we didn't know that at the time. And then when people came to Cameron, I mean, they, you know, you know, I mean, Cameron are, you know, you know, they, they, they'll go after you, you know, they, they like to, you know, I like to think that they don't go below the belt, but sometimes they do. But, you know, a lot of it's fun. It's, you know, so I just thought that was the environment of college basketball. We go on the road, yeah. you know, people, the crowd gets after us. When, when fans come to, uh, you know, one of the great stories, and I, know I, I was a senior in high school, had already committed to Duke, went down for a game. Duke played Georgia Tech. And they had, you know, lethal weapon three, Kenny Anderson, Brian Oliver, mm. Dennis so before the game, about an hour before the game, Dennis is out there shooting. And every time he, he, he makes a shot, the Cameron crazies go crazy. They're kind of messing with him. So he pulls somebody out of the crowd. It happens to be Seth Davis, who now works for CBS. And Seth was a, a, a writer for the, for the school newspaper. Uh, he pulls Seth out. He gives him five three-pointers. 
and Seth shoots, you know, five shots. They all airball. So then Dennis goes to half court, shoots a shot, nothing but net. And the, cra- wow. the camera crazy, go crazy. And so then in layup line, or excuse me, in player introductions, you know, Dennis had lost a lot of weight that year. He lost like 30 pounds. He was, he was skinny and he was junior year. And, uh, and then during player intros, they announce him. And then they throw Twinkies and, ho- and Hostess cupcakes on the floor uh, when they announce, you know, announce him during player intros. And so, you know, that was the atmosphere. I mean, it was tongue in cheek, but it was also sometimes below the belt. And um, so anyway, I say all this to say that I, you know, I don't know if I fully understood, you know, people's feelings, good or bad, towards Duke. Um, you know, and, and I didn't really realize that, I guess, you know, until later on when that became, you know, a little bit more, more, um, you know, it, it, it became a little bit more obvious and, and certainly people mm-hmm. reflecting on that. But, you know, we didn't read the paper. We didn't have access to the internet. I and mean, I read the school yeah, newspaper. But, so you didn't really know. You didn't really understand and, 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 and get a great feeling. But I think a lot of it had to do with our success. I think a lot of it had to do with the perception of a private school. Uh, a lot of it had to do with we had some really good white players, you know, and, and um, um, but anyway, it was an interesting time and certainly a time mm-hmm. that people remember many, many, you know, many years later and still want to talk about and write about and discuss. Yeah, well, people always, they still like you. They, you never kind of got drawn into that. I mean, in, in the NBA, when you were, you know, all-star voting, you were commonly the first, first second uh, vote getter. And obviously you were a great player, but it, it's also popularity. You don't vote for people you don't like, even though, even though they're great. So you, you were always able to keep your reputation as, as a, a guy that people still like. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I like to say, you know, when you think of the bad boys with the Pistons, you know, I think I think Joe Dumars kind of always rose above that and was someone who, mm-hmm. even though he was a, and I, and I played with Joe later on, so that's why I'm referencing him, but, you know, even though he was a part of the bad boys and, and you know, was an MVP in, in, in the finals uh, in 1989, uh, I think oh, he was always kind of, you know, maybe considered a good guy and, and respected and liked. And for some reason, I, I guess, you know, in the midst of all the, the, the chaos at Duke and, and, and the feelings and, and sort of maybe what the media, you know, you know played into and, and, and sort of creating this, you know, polarization of sorts. Um, yeah, I, mean, I never really got booed like that. I mean, I saw Christian and, and Bobby just, you know, some of the hate directed towards them was, was incredible. But um, I mean, I guess that's a good thing. I don't know. Um, yeah. But, no, I seem to be pretty, pretty well respected during those times. And, um, um, but I, I think overall, look, we, we became, you know, the big, you know, the big empire, the big, uh, you know, the Yankees, we became sort of the establishment because we had success and, um, and that, that goes with it. You know, that, that's part of having success and being a part of a great team. Um, you know, at times you're going to be loved and at times you're going to be hated. And, um, and I think that was sort of beginning to happen at that time for, for Duke in the program. Yeah. So, you know, you, you win two championships in a row to start out. And, you, and the, the last two years, as you were saying, didn't go quite as well. You can't win four. You can't go four for four. They don't, they don't allow that. But your NBA career, um, one thing about, again, you started so quickly. You didn't even, there was very little transition. I think the NBA game was, re- you really fit the NBA game. You got a whole more space. Um, so what was the transition like? Cause it did seem like it was pretty effortless. Well, you know, I, I think for me, um, the transition really started my senior year in college and, um, you know, prior to then, you know, part of, part of my, part of my story and part of my, you know, I don't want to say issue, but one of the things that I had to overcome was I think, you know, being comfortable standing out and being comfortable with this idea that, um, you know, um, like, you know, I'm not one of the guys. I'm, I'm, you know, I I have talent and it's okay to embrace that talent and really stand out and separate myself. And I thought my senior year, you know, there was no, you know, back then it was like a pecking, obviously it's a one and done culture right now, but back then, you know, the seniors, you know, you defer to the seniors, you know, and, and, and the seniors took on the person, personality and the responsibility of the team. And so my senior year, it was on me. And, and so I had that responsibility of, of not just being the best player, but also meeting the team. 
and, and I developed a, a good relationship and trust with Coach K that year. Uh, and so I think that year really gave me a good foundation and a confidence where you come in now as a, as a lottery pick, there's an expectation. There's an expectation where you can help turn around a franchise. Uh, and so a lot of that came from that year, but Detroit had won 20 games, um, really kind of in the midst, you know, really bottomed out, I guess, you know, in the rebuilding process. Isaiah Thomas had just retired. Lambeer had retired, you know, the year before. Joe was still on that team. So it was a transitional uh, moment for that, that franchise. Lindsey Hunter, Allen Henderson had been drafted the year before. Uh, so I came in and, um, you know, right away, um, you know, had success. I mean, I remember my first game, we played the Lakers opening night and, you know, 25, 10, 5, I mean, I, I put up numbers and, um, you know, one of the things that really helped me was Quinn Snyder, who at that time, he played at Duke, obviously coaching now with Utah, but Quinn had been an assistant coach prior to uh, my senior year. And um, he was coming back to Duke to be a, a grad assistant. So we played a lot of pickup ball at Duke, you know, that summer before my rookie year. And back then, you know, I used to handle the ball like Magic or Steve Smith or, or any big guy who kind of used their body to shield uh, the, the ball from the defender. But in pickup ball, I would, you know, bop, bop. I'd come downhill and cross you up and, you know, try to be like Isaiah or try to be like Chris Jackson or, you know, Tim Hardaway. And Quinn used to say, hey, why don't you play like that in the games? Like, you can do that. You can you can come downhill at people, you know, in and out, crossover, whatever, and get by. You don't have to play with your back to the defender. And so I, I remember taking that in. And then when I got to the league, um, right away, like even pickup ball, when I first got to Detroit the week before camp, I remember just being able to get by people. And, and, um, and so I think that confidence really gained. And I don't think there were a lot of small forwards at that time who had handles, you know, you had guys who could handle the ball, but a guy who could come at you and, and make a move. And so, um, so that really kind of worked to my advantage, I think in part right away. Um, and then just, you know, being seasoned and experienced at Duke and being a little bit older, I think all of that, um, it really worked out well. And I, I, you know, I, I remember calling my boys up like, man, the league is easy. Like, you know, I remember coming in like the first 10, 20 games, like, Man, like this is easy, you know. And of course, once they get the scouting report on you, it becomes a little bit more difficult. But uh, mm -hmm. I was able to make a splash right away, for sure. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's it is it is easy until they start uh, you know putting you on the ground a few times, and I guess they're they're gonna make you take some lumps. Uh, what, what was it like to play for Doug Collins? He seems like he'd be a players' coach uh, type of guy. So Doug was was great. So I, you know, I knew Doug. You know, Doug was a was a, a teammate's parent. You know, Chris Collins, who I played with at Duke. Oh, that's right. Years. Yeah, I forgot and, about that. Uh, that was my first introduction, you know, to to Doug. And um, and, and through you know, and through that, I found out because at that time he was in television. I knew he had coached, you know, Michael Jordan and the Bulls. Uh, this was back when I was at Duke, um, but I didn't realize, you know, his his career and just you know, uh, great college player, great NBA player. You know, had had some injuries later in his career, um, the whole debacle with the, the 72 uh, Olympic Games and, and being denied a gold medal. Oh, yeah, uh, so I didn't try right. any of that until, you know, I got to college. Uh, and so after my first year, they hired Doug and, and, and Doug came in and, you know, it was tough because, you know, we always talk about culture and, and, and sports and in life and in business, and you want to have a culture. And at that point, do, uh, Detroit did not have a culture and um, they'd had success, um, but that culture did not sustain. And sometimes when you come in and you try to change culture, it can be incredibly painful. Breaking habits, uh, changing people's mindsets and thought processes. And so after four years of a great culture at Duke, where it was about championships and doing things the right way, one year in Detroit, you know, 28 wins, a number of losses, too many to count. I had developed bad habits. You know, I got away from, you know, what was, what it took to be successful. And, uh, and so, you know, Doug came in and right away, he changed that. And it was hard at first for all of us, 
but it was necessary. We went from 28 wins to 46 wins. Doug, um, X's and O's, probably the smartest coach I've ever been around. Just a genius. Mm. Could diagram plays. You know, we, we were always prepared. Um, just really fought the game on, you know, on, on a level that I, I, I don't know if I've ever been around before. Um, and, you know, we went from, like I said, 28 wins to 46 wins to 54 wins. Um, and he also recognized, and maybe from, you know, having, you know, watched me play at Duke uh, my senior year, but he put the ball in my hands. You know, he put the ball in my hands and basically said, you're, you're a point forward. This is how we're going to go. And I think he was able to, um, you know, create an offensive scheme that, that you know, catered to, to my talents, but also to the talents that we had, you know, around me. And uh, he got the most out of what we had those years. And, um, but gave me a real solid foundation for success in the NBA uh, that allowed me to navigate, uh, you know, many peaks and valleys throughout my 19 years in the league. Was the, was the Olympic experience memorable? Um, I mean, when, you, when, you, when you're in the NBA, it's, it's, it's the, you know, the, the top league of, of basketball. And the, the Olympics is something that we're supposed, we're supposed to win. So the, like the pressure's on you from day one that you have to win this. Was that, was that experience mem memorable to you? That was a great experience. Um, you know, I was uh, selected after my first year. And then after my second year, we had the Olympics in 96. And so I was the youngest guy on the team. Um, we had six of the original dream team uh, Olympians on that team. Um, the, other, the other two young guys were, were Penny and Shaq. Uh, they were uh, a year older than me and also, you know, came into the league a, a, year, a year and also two years in front of me. Um, but it was fun. And, and for me, you know, the real, um, the real benefit was playing against Scotty every day. You know, I mean, we practiced, and a lot of times the practices were more competitive than the games. Um, right. You know, the rest of the world is caught up now, and there's more thought, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and certainly the need for a program um, in terms of, you know, just nurturing uh, USA basketball and having the success that we all, you know, we all expected to be. But back then, it was kind of like put 12 guys together, let's roll the ball out there, and we'll, we'll, we'll win. And we pretty much did that. But the practices were, were where I got better because I went against Scotty. He was my, you know, I was, we were the two small forwards on the team. And, and that, you know, I learned a lot. Um, I, I like to say that I wasn't, you know, nothing I did in the summer, no one, no pickup game, no individual instruct, like nothing was going to replicate that month of playing against Scotty every day. And because we blew yeah. everybody out and because, you know, we all had sort of equal minutes, you know, we lived for the practice days and we, we wanted to practice, you know, and so he had competitors. And so the teams are always mixed up, but I was always matched up against Scotty Pippen. And so, you know, I got a chance to, you know, I worked out with Carl Malone. I got a chance to get to know all these guys, kind of see what makes them great, uh, learn their personalities, meet their family. So it was a great bonding experience at a time, you know, understand back then, like we didn't, we didn't hang out with guys on other teams, you know, it was a different culture than it is now. I remember my all, my first all-star game in 95 um, in Phoenix. And uh, I'm a rookie. I, I was leading vote getter. And Joe Dumars was also my teammate. He was on the all-star team as well. So we're in the locker room and I'm looking around and there's like Pat Ewing and Scotty and all these guys that, you know, I'm watching on TV just a year before. And Joe, he didn't say a whole lot, but Joe grabs me and says, nah, we're Pistons. We don't, we don't, you know, we don't do that. We don't hang. And so there was still that like old school 80s where you don't get to know guys on other teams, but the Olympics sort of allowed for that. You were, you were forced to do that because you spent all this time together. And I came out of that, like, I came out of that feeling like, okay, I belong in that top tier. You know, I wasn't sure before then. And, you know, my team hadn't had great success, but I came out of that like, okay, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on that level. I belong, you know, in that in that conversation, and uh, and I think my play, you know, ended up reflecting that moving forward. So, um, unfortunately, you had a you had a pretty serious ankle injury and in, in after effects, and um, so you know, obviously, you, your game probably had to change a little bit. You probably didn't have quite the explosion you may have had before. 
but you're able to have this very long career after after that injury. So what what do you attribute that that to that you're able to hang on in there? I mean, obviously, a very talented guy. You didn't have to play basketball, um, you know, th- th- that much longer. You could have retired a little bit, but you you were you played well. You were still very productive. Uh, yeah, what do you attribute that that to that your your longevity in the game? You know, that's a good question. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm paying for it now because I you know I have tremendous uh, arthritis in my ankle. So you know, I mean, oh, I'm, sorry for that. No, no, that's fine. I mean, it, it is what it is. Um, but no, I mean, I think, I think, um, I don't know. Maybe having been around professional sports and you know my father and, and his generation and certainly contemporaries of his, you ultimately understand that you know when it's over, it's over. And, and, and that's a hard thing for athletes sometimes to accept. Uh, it was even hard, I think, for some of my high school buddies who weren't fortunate enough to go on and play in college. It was hard for them to accept. And, uh, and so, you know, I wanted to give it every opportunity, one, to get healthy and to resume my career. And then, and then two, I was different. Like I, I, you know, I missed a considerable part of four years. And, um, you know, in recent years, we, we looked at Derrick Rose and, and some of his challenges and struggles with his injuries, but he only, he missed two years. Like I, I doubled that. And, and so I think when I came back, um, you know, physically, I wasn't the same. They, they, they took a wedge out of my heel and tilt. I mean, I, you know, so there's certain things physically I couldn't do uh, still. I was able to hide it, you know, when I played. Um, but then also I was older, you know, and I lost a little bit of that pop. Um, but one thing I think I lost, um, when you lose, when you lose the confidence in your ability to stay healthy, which for four years I did, um, you sometimes lose a little bit of the confidence in yourself. And what I mean by that is, is um, in the '90s when I, you know, when I had that nice run. After that Olympics, like I felt like I was the best player every time I stepped on the court. Now I might not have been the best player <laughs> always, but I felt that. Way. And there's this sort of, there's this like incredible belief in yourself when you're at, at a certain level that you know you give me any four guys, we're gonna we're gonna win. Like that that that's that's the attitude, the mindset, the swagger, whatever you want to call it, you have. And I think that plays a huge role in you being great. You know, we we talk about another. Uh, Virginia ball player, Allen Iris, like he had great confidence in his abilities. And, and I might not have shown it the same way, but I had that. Like, I felt like, you know, you know, I felt like I was the best player. And so when you go through like all of that with the injury and you start to question and you start to doubt, I came back, I didn't think I was the best player. And it was almost like, I just was happy to be back. I was just, like, you know, and, and that's a beautiful thing. You know, you, you, get, you have something that's taken away. You come back now with a whole different mindset. But you talked earlier about edge. And you talked about, like, I lost that, like, I'm the dominant player. And it was, it was interesting. One, I, was, I went back to Duke. Um, you know, I had a whole, we could do a whole podcast just on my injury and the whole, you know, what happened. But I, I went back to Duke, I think it was in 03. And I went to get... You know, I had checkups for my for my ankle after my fourth my fifth ankle surgery, and uh, I remember going to dinner with Coach K. and uh, And I was there. My 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 physical therapist was there with me, and Coach K asked me, "Like, so Grant, who do you who are the top five players in the league?" So I started listing you know, this guy, that guy, this guy. Okay, who are the next five? And you know, I started listing. I'm trying to be be thoughtful and and, and be accurate about it. And then we get down to like the top 30 players. And at the end, he's like, you didn't mention yourself. And, 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 and so I, you know, I understand now what he was trying to do. Um, but like you go through some, you know, what I went through with the ankle and I, I don't think people fully understand. It's just your overall sort of aura. You're just your, your overall belief. Um, and so I came back, I was still competitive, but I don't know if I believe I could be at that level um, as a result of, of all those injuries. And so, you know, you, you, you kind of settle in, you know, and, and I did, and I'm glad I did. I played nine more years, had great experiences, um, had some great moments, um, but I still had that desire to want to play. 
And, um, you know, I still wanted to play. And I used to always say, I'm going to make up for it on the back end. I'm going to play till I'm 40. And the funny thing is when I, when I, when I turned 40, my body expired. Uh, so I was saying, I should have said 45. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, I, yeah. I, I think I, I experienced everything during my career. I experienced being, you know, at an elite top 10, top five level. Uh, I experienced the injuries and the heartbreak of, of fighting through that. Uh, I experienced being, you know, you know, more of a, a second tier, third tier all-star when I, when I got back. Um, then a role player. And then even my last year uh, in LA with the Clippers, I didn't play. So I was on the bench. So I know, so I, I kind of felt and went through every experience. And, you know, there, there's a sense of pride that sometimes when you're a great player, it's hard to humble yourself, you know, and accept that you're no longer that player. And, uh, and some guys have a difficult time doing that. But I did get a great amount of joy the last part of my career. That's great. Uh, being able to play, no question. Do, do you think your game, uh, in today's game, you were talking about, we were talking about jazz earlier. We went, from, we went from big band running plays to kind of bebop, you know, lots of, you know, 70s, 80s, uh, you, know, you know, and then all of a sudden we're all the way to free jazz or avant-garde. I mean, it's, basketball is completely free flow now. I mean, you, you were a point forward, you know, one of the first to do that. You know, I guess it was, there was like John Johnson and, and Paul Pressey and then I guess Magic and stuff. You created a position. So you, you started this, um, you helped start this, but now it's, it's completely open. Do you, do you think if you were playing in today's game, uh, growing up in today's game, you'd be more of an outside shooter, first of all, because everyone's shooting threes. Uh, that was a very small part of your game in high school. I, I, I mean, I'm sure you made, you made some, but you were going to the hole, you were assistant, you didn't do a whole lot of that. Do you think growing up in today's game, you would have embraced it or you think you would have been probably the same player you were? You know, um, you know, that's a that's a good question. Um, well, I, I'd like to. Uh, I would have. I would like to have. I would like to have played in today's game. Um, and, and, and I say that because it was a little bit more structure back then. There was less up and down. It was more half court. It was more physical. You know, you had the traditional three out, two inside. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of space. Um, you know, the middle was was clogged. You know, centers and power forwards played in the paint. And so someone who was like myself, a slasher, uh, it could get congested. And 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 I, you know, look, I still went in there. Like I went in there and, and you absorbed that, you took that. But now the spacing is such where everybody's hovered uh, you know, around the three-point line. Bigs, you know, are expected to shoot. Uh, so players who who can get by and, you know, now there's more space. And, and, you know, for me, it was never the guy who was guarding me I was worried about. I was always looking to see where the help was once I got by that person. And so now it's so much more wide open and we've taken the physicality out of the game. And so now defensively, you can't hand check, you can't bump, you can't be as physical defensively uh, like you once could. So, you know, I get excited thinking about the idea of playing in today's game. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard and it's, it's tough because I think part of that comes from playing pickup ball, you know, playing at the playground and, you know, rims being crooked and, you know, and you always had like one good shooter, but not, you didn't really have a lot of great shooters, you know, it was about- just, You're right, just one good shooter. <laughs> getting to the cup, you know, and, 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 uh, and so I probably would have had, a, you know, worked more on my jump shot, um, you know, it used to be funny. You you go to the gym and you take five, five shots from five spots, and that was like working on your shot. You know, and uh, at least back yeah. for me back in high school. Uh, but That's now, true. you know, shooting and the skill and, and all of that is is far greater. Uh, and, and and Steph Curry and, and the three point line and and so you know, I probably would be a better shooter. But I'd like to think that I'd still have the ability to put the ball on the floor. I always, I always wanted like when I was. Young, I, I looked at Michael Jackson. I looked at the Pearl. I looked at you know um, um, Isaiah Thomas. Like I wanted to handle like those guys, and I wanted to be able to play north south. Uh, I wanted to be able to attack. Uh, you know, Jordan was someone who we uh, emulated. He was constantly attacking. Dr. J, um, and so I, I think that hopefully there'd be a balance between you know shooting from the perimeter, 
uh, and go into the rim. I like to look at it like a, like a fastball pitcher um, who all of a sudden, you know, learns how to throw a curveball, you know, and, and mm-hmm. you, know, you don't want to fall in love with that curveball. You still want to, you, know, you want to be able to keep them off balance. And mm-hmm. I think for me, as I developed more of a mid-range shot and became very efficient in my, you know, my, my last few years in Detroit, um, I, I got to a point where I felt like I was on guard and, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that would only be, you know, I know it sounds real arrogant, but that, that would be only, uh, you know, magnified in today's game. Um, yeah. But yeah. I, I broke it down like, you know, areas of domination, you know, okay. You know, you have transition, you have uh, offensive rebounds, you have posting up, you have mid range, you have off the bounce mid range, uh, you have catch and shoot. And, and these were things that I got really you know, intentional on in terms of working on in the off season. Um, so it wasn't just one thing. It was sort of six or seven, getting to the free throw line. Uh, and so you start, and I even started to think, okay, if I get out in transition and I attack off the bounce and get to the paint, I'll get anywhere from three to five layups a game or, or, or you know, shots at the rim. Um, if I'm being aggressive off the bounce, I'm going to draw fouls. So, you know, I'm going to get to the line six times. So if I make five free throws, I get, you know, 10 points. I'm at 15 points and I haven't even taken a jump shot yet. And, and, and so you start looking at the game and, and just sort of understanding it from that standpoint. Okay, you know, what are my weapons? And what am I going to use here on this particular play and possession? Or, you know, um, I, I'm hot. I've hit a bunch of jump shots in the game. Well, let me not forget about my drive. Let me make sure I can... So just keep the defense guessing and keeping them off balance yeah. and being able to score and attack in a variety of different ways. And that was sort of mm-hmm. a thought process as I got, you know, a little bit older in my Detroit years, you know, before I had my, mm-hmm. my injury mm-hmm. back. Well, one thing that you, you definitely did, um, you're very lucky. I mean, we're, we're very, um, we all dream of having NBA careers like you had. I mean, I would I make, I make us all so happy, but you really seem to have your life full of your passions in your, in your retirement. You know, you seem like, I know you're, you're heavily involved in art, artwork, uh, African-American art. Uh, you, your TV work is, is fantastic. Um, now you're working with, to, to create um, change in the game. I mean, to help uh, with, with Team USA, you'll be able to, to innovate there as well. Um, you have to really, uh, uh, you, it sounds like you're really, it seems like you're really enjoying your post basketball life. You know, I am, I am, um, you know, I've been retired now, say I retired in 2013. Um, so I think sometimes you have to try a lot of things to figure out what you like and what you don't like. And, you know, sometimes you have to try to figure out what you're good at or maybe what you're not good at. Um, I think I, I've been fortunate to do a number of things and, and to sort of be at a point now where I'm, I'm, I'm content and fulfilled uh, and excited, I guess, about, you know, about, you know, you know, my life, my careers, um, and all that that represents, but, you know, it, it, it's challenging, you know, the, this sort of transitional point for, for athletes and, you know, you, however long you play, um, you know, that, that, that defines you, you know, in a lot of ways. And, you know, I think it, it, it really, it didn't, fully define me. You know, I think I, I've always tried to, you know, um, you know, sort of broaden my horizons and, and, and you know, expose myself to, to new things and, and be more complete than just an athlete. But when, when you walk away from the game, um, you know, it, it's hard. It's not easy. This is something you've devoted a considerable amount of time and effort and energy and passion. Uh, and, and I think for a lot of athletes, there can be a void. And, and so I think for me, when I retired, I had a lot of interests that, that I wanted to pursue um, and a lot of things that kind of, you know, had to be put on hold while I was playing. I think looking back, um, the mistake I made was trying to do everything at once. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and, um, and, you know, now like all of a sudden you have all this freedom, you have all this time and, and, and you, you know, you, you try to do everything. And, and I think I, I, if there was a lesson learned was I, you know, I spread myself a little too thin. Um, and, um, you know, I don't have to do everything just, you know, at this point in my life. Um, but 
you know, I've kind of hit a sweet spot here. Um, you know, I, I'm working in a number of different roles. Uh, I'm, I'm around sports. You know, I serve on some boards. You know, I serve on, I just joined the Campbell Soup Board. I joined a REIT board. Sure. Um, so that's, you know, stimulating, challenging, rewarding. Um, you know, I, I, so I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm in a, I'm enjoying myself and I'm having fun. Um, but I love working, you know, in and around sports and around the game of basketball and whether that's broadcasting, whether that's, you know, that's ownership, uh, whether that's working with, you know, the NCAA, which is going through some challenges right now um, or USA basketball, um, you know, it's a way to, to serve the game. It's a way to sort of, you know, make money and profit from the game. But it's a way to just be in and around the game uh, that, that I love and that I enjoy. Well, you know, Grant, I, I went way over the, the time you allotted me. Uh, I just want to thank you for, for doing this. You didn't even make me chase you down. You, uh, you reached out graciously to, uh, to, you know, to do this. Um, it means a lot to the players of the Northern region that you care enough about us to, to want to be involved, to, to tell your story to us. Um, you know, we're very lucky. I've, you know, I've been talking to Coach Bird, Coach Thompson, you know, all these great players. We have such a great history and culture together. So, you know, really, I really want to thank you for, for doing this because I think um, it just it means a lot to all the players. And we've never forgotten you. And we've, we've all followed your career. And for you to do this, it's just, it's just an amazing opportunity for us. No, well, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I just certainly want to thank you and, and applaud you for, um, oh, thank you. you know, creating this platform. And, and really, I think shining light on uh, you know on some incredible moments. And you know, I think um, you're, you're you're essentially a historian here by you know, having a chance to, to to you know to tell and share these stories and document them. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I will say, I, I don't you know I'm not. My parents still live you know in Northern Virginia. Um, you know, I still have roots to South Lakes, but I, I don't you know I don't know entirely the scene uh, of, of high school basketball in Northern Virginia now. But you know, I do know that way back when it, it, it was really special, and it was a really. Yeah. I've even talked to. I've even talked with uh, Daryl, um, Daryl Branch, and a couple guys, buddies of mine. Like, it was such a like. There should be like a documentary or something to sort of just tell that story, uh, to complement sort of the, you know the work that you're doing. But because it was special, and there was a connection to the community, um, you know, people would go to games and you know crowds would be there and uh standing room only and i'm not i'm not just you know saying for my games i mean i remember prior to being in high school going and and, and watch it was a, it was an event and it was something that uh was really special and i'm not sure if it's still still quite like that but um a lot goes into why that's the case but nevertheless it was still a great moment in time so the work you're doing and, and certainly bringing these stories to life and retelling, and uh, and sometimes like Russell Payton, questionable uh, memories in terms of what he's sharing. Uh, all of that's great. All of it's fun, and uh, and all of it's needed. So so I thank you for for your work. Yeah. What you've done. Well, well, you're welcome. It's great. And if you guys want to get a South Lakes, I know Coach Branch, uh, Daryl had mentioned getting some South Lakes guys together and and chit chatting. So you know, if you guys ever want to do that, just reach out, and I love to be involved. I'm, I'm sure we would love to do it. We might need like three or four hours. Um, we, have yeah. a lot of, we have a lot of personalities on those teams. So I might be, uh, I might just be quiet and listen and laugh because uh, we, we, we definitely have a lot of personality from, uh, from, from some of those guys, but we'll, uh, we'll definitely look to do that at some point. That sounds great. All right, well, well thank, thanks again, Grant. I hope you have a wonderful day and a good, and a good weekend. All right, thank you, Julie. I appreciate you. Okay, okay, Grant. You too, bud. Mm -hmm.